as we are starting today's conference. You can bring your cup of tea and coffee to your respective tables. Thank you. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you to the conference, the second conference on lung cancer enabling innovation in treatment pathway. I am Harsha Pandey, your host for the day. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all and our respective dignitaries to, to today's conference. Thanks to each one of you for joining us today. May I please have a huge round of applause for all of you. Thank you. Few house calls before we start today's conference. I would request everyone to please put your phone on silent. In case of any urgent call, you can go step out of the conference hall and attend the same. We're gonna have this particular conference in three different sessions and we're gonna have question answer round. I would request you all to please raise your hand, identify yourself, identify your question, and then please proceed with it. We are going to continue this conference today with a networking lunch, so you're gonna have ample amount of time to connect with your peers. To have an auspicious start of the day, I would request our esteemed dignitaries to please come forward for lighting the ceremonial lamp. I would request Professor D.S. Rana, Chairperson, ASOCHAM, National Healthcare Council and Board of Trustees, Sri Gangaram Hospital, to please come forward. Ms. Nilima Devedi, Senior Director, External Affairs, Market Access, Communication, Policy and Government Affairs, MSD Pharmaceutical Private Limited, to please come forward. Mr. Chandra Shekhar Sibal, Senior Vice President, Fuji Film India Private Limited, to please come forward. Mr. Deep Jyoti Das, Head Medical Planning and Operations, Assam Cancer Care Foundation. Mr. Yutaro Sitoya, Team Lead, Non-Communicable Disease, World Health Organization, India. Dr. D.K. Gupta, Co-Chairperson, Asuchan, National Digital Healthcare Task Force and Chairman and Managing Director, Felix Hospital. Dr. Akshay Jain, Joint Director, National Health Authority, GOL, will be joining us shortly. May I please have a huge round of applause for respective dignitaries? very much. I would request all our panelists to please join us on the dais for our very first session, inaugural session, Lung Cancer Treatment, Roadmap for Robust Patient Outcomes. I would request Professor D.S. Rana, Chairperson, Asocham National Healthcare Council and Board of Trustee, Sri Gangaram Hospital, to please present his welcome address. I would request Ms. Nilima Divedi to please join us on the dais. Thank you, ma'am. I would request Mr. Chandra Shekhar Sibal, Senior Vice President, Fuji Film, India Private Limited, to please join us on the dais. I would request Mr. Jeep Deep Jyoti Das, Head Medical Planning and Operations, Assam Cancer Care Foundation, to please join us on the dais. Dr. Yutaro Sitoya, Team Lead Non-Communicable Disease, World Health Organization India, to please join us on the dais. Dr. Akshay Jain, Joint Director, National Health Authority, GOL, will be joining us shortly. Dr. D.K. Gupta, Co-Chairperson, ASOCHAM National Digital Healthcare Task Force and Chairman and Managing Director, Felix Hospital, to please join us on the dais. Thank you very much. Now I would request Do Professor D.S. Rana to please present a floral welcome to Dr. Deep Jyoti Das. I would also request Dr. D.K. Gupta to please present a floral welcome to Dr. Yutaro Sitoya.
Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for all the panelists for joining us. Now I would request Professor D.S. Rana to please uh, present his welcome address for this inaugural session. Thank you so much. Dignitaries on the dais, of the dais and delegates to the second Lang conference being organized by SOCHAM on behalf of, behalf of SOCHAM. I welcome you all to this important conference. An important topic is being discussed, you know. A lot of experts from the lung cancer, from various fields, they are going to address various issues. I can see the program. And all of you know that lung cancer is also one of the important cancer. And we know the pollution of air, especially smoking, is very closely and scientifically linked to lung cancer. And how far this pollution of the air, or bad air quality of Delhi and other metropolitan cities is affecting our lung health, we, all are, we are all aware, you know. We all know the problem, but we are not finding solutions. My interest will not be in treating lung cancer or once it has happened, you know. Basically, we had to prevent it. And this is a preventable disease most of the time. We should have stress on that. Of course, I was just discussing with one of the speakers right now, young American college working in the Artemis Hospital. A lot of targeted therapy has increased the life expectancy from a few months to a few years, maybe three to four years. But that should not be our goal, and that therapy is not afforded by almost 80% of Indians, you know. How can we help in stopping smoking? We can all help, and I was just talking to my friends there, that at individual, at individual uh, you know, we had to add uh, Individually, we have to work in our family. We have to educate our children, our family members, then you can extend it to your relatives. And this is how it is going to happen. Of, of course, the government is playing its role through media, you know, electronic or print media, that smoking is injurious to health. But still, the cigarette industry is perishing, you know. So we, when we know that cigarette is the cause for, is a major cause and a proven cause of lung cancer, why cannot we take this step? Can we address this? So I know we have got all limitation, but however, for whatsoever talk you are going to give today, I wish you best of luck for that, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I would request Ms. Nilima Divedi, Senior Director, External Affairs, Market Access Communication, Policy and Government Affairs, MSD, Pharmaceutical Private Limited, to please uh, present her welcome address to us. Thank you, ma'am. Can I please have a round of applause? Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and thank you, SOCHAM, for organizing this conference on such an important topic uh, of lung cancer. And uh, November being the Lung Cancer Awareness Month, this re really becomes very, very important for all of us, all the key stakeholders, uh, to really discuss uh, the issues, the challenges, the barriers which exist uh, in the lung cancer uh, treatment ecosystem. So I have been given this responsibility to just do the context setting. Uh, so after inaugural, there would be a few sessions where we would discuss about these barriers, these impediments, 
uh, we would also, uh, in fact, uh, uh, see some patient journey, patients talking about the journey, the continuum of care. Uh, and also, uh, we would discuss uh, about few of the gaps, as I mentioned. Uh, there are so many gaps, but uh, here, uh, I think we would highlight, just emphasize upon few of the gaps and how we all together uh, work towards bringing a solution, bringing something which really eases uh, life, the entire continuum of care for the patient. So, uh, as we all know, and this August gathering, in fact, knows better than me about uh, the lung cancer, uh, which is one of the most often diagnosed cancer, uh, which leads to uh, the cancer-related death worldwide. And also in India, uh, lung cancer accounts for 5.9% of all the cancers. And the sad part is that 8.1% of the total cancer, of all the cancers, there is a cancer-related death in lung cancer. The prevalence of smoking has been found in the patient that, uh, especially in lung cancer patient, almost 80% uh, of the patients are uh, from the smoking sites. That's the prevalence. Uh, let's talk about, we, uh, we discussed about the gaps. Uh, the first gap which we all see is the screening and early detection. Uh, by the time patients come to know about the lung cancer, it is already too late. Uh, they are already at, uh, at the advanced stage. Uh, so how can we work together with the government, industry, uh, and all the key stakeholders uh, to really uh, do something which, is, which really helps patient uh, in early detection? So low-dose computed tomography, LDCT, uh, which, uh, of chest, which is really an established strategy uh, for the screening of lung cancer. Uh, however, despite such a substantial number of uh, disease burden in the country, still uh, we don't have this as a strategy. We are not having a pan-India screening protocol uh, from uh, LDCT. Uh, there are various constraints and reasons, what I believe, uh, by the government. One of the key reasons, of course, there is the logistic, there are um, uh, many other uh, concerns. But in addition to that, uh, one of the key concerns, what we have uh, found during our discussion with the stakeholders in the government, especially in RCCs and all, that the prevalence of uh, tuberculosis and uh, because that comes as a false positive. And that is one of the reasons because of that we don't have LDCT uh, as a screening protocol, uh, pan-India. Uh, so that is one of the constraints on which we need to really look upon. Uh, the second one, of course, we all know that uh, biomarker testing uh, has been seen, and in particular in the need of, uh, uh, in fact, for lung cancer, uh, is one of the very, very successful, uh, in fact, testing mechanism. Uh, so that also we need to see how we can really provide access to such, uh, such testing mechanism to our patients. Uh, similarly, uh, there are many other like uh, flexible bronchoscopy and uh, transthoracic sampling are one of the most widely used technique for a diagnosis of lung cancer. However, these facilities, again, are not really available uh, in the rural or peri-urban setting. For that, the patient have to travel all the way to the urban centers. Uh, so that, again, is a big gap. Uh, and because of that, the patients are not able to really avail these facilities. Any discussion on lung cancer will be really in, in, uh, incomplete if we don't really mention uh, the leading cause, which is the tobacco uses. And uh, it is really rather shameful now to see uh, uh, that uh, India is the second largest consumer of tobacco product in the world. Uh, almost 28% of our total population is using tobacco in some form or the other. And if you look at the prevalence and the disease burden of cancer, 
all cancer. This is also in the range of 28 to 30 percent. So that is one thing which we all need to really see because this is the awareness month. How can we really curb it down? How can we really curb down the use of tobacco and tobacco products? There are several advertisements and celebrities, they keep advertising. I think that's another thing which regulator needs to really look at. Uh, and in addition to that, as I mentioned, that PDL1 biomarker testing should be made available, at least in the RCCs, by the government. The second gap which uh, I wanted to emphasize is the unavailability of the trained oncologist. So one of the key, con and this is one of the key contributing factor, uh, and which really limits uh, uh, the, the cancer uh, care uh, in, in that ecosystem. So how can we really work? Um, and the data says that currently there is a need of more than 5,000 trained oncologists, whereas at this point of time, uh, we have less than 50%, which is approx 2,000 uh, oncologists are available in the country. And when we talk about medical oncologists, I think the number even like you no know, is is much 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 lesser. I think many a times uh, our, uh, uh, in fact, the radiologist and other oncologists have to step in um, into the medical oncology work, and they are providing uh, such services. It is also noteworthy that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, at this point of time. Uh, in fact, by 2030, there is a requirement of 10,000 trained oncologists. So we need to really see that, are we really geared up? Is our education system is going to meet the demand? Uh, so that is another challenge, because the way disease burden is going up, are we really ready and geared to, to really handle this? Uh, so one, of course, the availability we talked about, and also availability in future. So that's the other point which uh, I wanted to really uh, bring it out. And one of the potential solution here, what we foresee as an industry, is to encourage a rapid uptake of AI-enabled uh, second opinion and virtual tumor board platforms to help bridge this gap uh, of, of manpower. The third one, of course, is the access to cancer care, uh, uh, and, and that's another gap, is the lack of access to quality cancer care, uh, which has led to a situation where there is a stigma. So there is a much stigma in the cancer patients amongst, uh, in fact, and uh, amongst their family members, which has, uh, which, uh, has become a big barrier uh, especially in health-seeking behavior, in care-seeking behavior. So how can we really provide that confidence to our patients that, uh, that yes, they will get the right treatment? And how can we really counsel uh, the patient and their families? Because it's, stigma is also because of, uh, uh, because one, the facilities are far away, uh, all these centers are far away, and so logistic is another issue. Uh, then losing the livelihood and the work, work days is the other issue which, uh, which is found uh, amongst the family. And the last one which I wanted to highlight is the healthcare financing gap, especially for the modern cancer care treatment. So while we have Ayushman Bharat PMJY, which is really a great uh, uh, universal health coverage, I think one of the biggest, what we say in, in, in the world, where 500 million plus people uh, are covered. But is it really sufficient? Can it really provide access to modern cancer care facilities? Uh, what, uh, what we see that um, while we have one of the largest coverage, but it doesn't seek uh, the modern uh, treatment, uh, and it doesn't provide the modern uh, or targeted treatment to the patient. Uh, because of various other reasons, uh, affordability could be one of them. 
so the therapies like uh, monoclonal antibodies, targeted therapies, immuno-oncology treatment, um, and uh, so such treatments are still not being sought uh, for the patient uh, even under PMJY. So these are a few of the uh, key things. In fact, uh, why we are talking about only PMJY, even the people who are like, you know, we all are sitting in this room, the white collared people, are we really fully covered to really have access to such uh, uh, high quality modern therapies? No, because our insurance coverage system is, uh, it doesn't cover fully uh, to the modern therapies. Uh, even our uh, insurance provided by our employers or even our personal health insurance coverage is not adequate enough to really uh, provide access to, uh, like you know, fully provide access to such modern uh, therapies uh, for the cancer care. So we need to really uh, uh, think about it and in next two, three sessions what we have, uh, we are going to deliberate on that and the final recommendations will be shared with the ministry and the policy makers. But in this awareness uh, month since we all are, uh, we all have got together, I think this is really a very, very serious topic and we need to really, uh, uh, really uh, apply all our, uh, in fact, mind together that how can we really work and help those patients who are really, and their families who are really going through this. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. I would now request Mr. Chandrasekhar Sibyl, Senior Vice President, Fuji Film India Private Limited, to please present his industry address with all of us. A huge round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And, uh, thank you very much, uh, SOCHEM, for arranging this conference on uh, uh, this topic, and it's very important. I will take you through the Fujifilm presentation that what we are doing and what kind of a technologies we are bringing uh, upon the same. Can we have the presentation? Uh, so we'll be uh, we'll having some uh, changing of the slides. Can I have? So good morning, everyone. And I'm Chandrasekhar Sibbal, Senior Vice President, Head of Medical uh, Division in Fujifilm India Private Limited. Uh, you all know that Fujifilm is a more than 80 years old company. 1934, we started our operations worldwide. And uh, Mr. Kenji Sekano is our chairman. Taichi Goto is our CEO and president. And we have more than uh, 77,000 employees and around $23 billion uh, business worldwide. And as a Fujifilm, uh, when established in 34, we started with our X-ray films in 1936, then the endoscopy systems, digital X-rays, first CR system was invented by Fujifilm, medical imaging and uh, ima uh, image information management system, Synapse, which is a PAX, one of the best uh, PAX in the world, portable ultrasound system, veterinary clinical practices, then the Vaco Pure chemicals was acquired by Fujifilm. Then the Fujifilm Rally platform for AI has been uh, started, then the new manufacturing for site for endoscopy and the screening centers in India has been started as a name of Neura. And acquisition of Hitachi, uh, this increases our whole portfolio of products. And uh, you know that we have, we are the leaders in CR and DR technology. Apart from that, we have the bone densitometers and endoscopy packs, 3D workstations, AI, dry chemistry analyzers, wet chemistry analyzers, and diagnostic imaging with the Hitachi now, with the CT, MRI, ultrasound, and uh, fluoroscopy products are added into our portfolio. So as a Fujifilm is a one-stop solution uh, for providing the healthcare needs to the patients. And we are committed to uh, provide the service support. We have the call centers in Gurgaon and endoscopy uh, repair centers uh, in four corners of the country, uh, Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, Kolkata, and Delhi. Uh, we are committed to the education and training, uh, a lot of conferences, seminars, fellowship programs, customer trainings and workshops we keep on arranging uh, on the various topics. And as you know that cancer cases are in India are mainly, uh, the breast cancer is a major problem in India. So we are, uh, with our mammography machines, the full-field digital mammography, we have the, uh, a lot of uh, screening centers, more than 125 centers where the uh, breast screening is happening. 
Apart from that, we have a lung cancer screening. We have CT and MRI for that. Endoscopes, colonoscopes, bronchoscopes are there. So all these products are there who can, which can detect the cancer at a very, very early stage. And uh, Fujifilm and AI, with the help of AI now, we have a rally platform, uh, which is based on the Synapse 3D and PAC system. And uh, we have a uh, lot of uh, installations of these systems in India. Uh, 70 uh, sites are there. And we have many, many uh, AI systems which are working and uh, which are able to detect the lung cancer at a very, very early stage with the help of a screening programs, with a low-dose screening program. And apart from that, digital uh, digitization of medical records and uh, providing the help with the help of the AI engine and uh, the doctors can see and uh, uh, see the things at early stage. So this is a very, uh, AI is a very important stage. And then the PPP and the public-private partnership and screening, we have tied up with the Krishna uh, for many, many centers across Assam, UP, Himachal, and many other states where they are doing the teleradiology with our uh, systems and able to provide the reports in a very faster time. So uh, patient benefits are there, like faster diagnosis, improved patient care, efficient patient medical records, rural and remote area coverage is there and supports the COVID appropriate behavior and the reduction of carbon footprint because uh, to avoid the films actually. So we provide a one-stop solution for the customer and for the patient and doctor can give the reports very fast. We are also partnering with Government of India for Never Stop, uh, uh, this thing, uh, Never Stop campaign is there for TB Mukh Bharat, TB Harega, Desh Jeetega and uh, we, have, uh, we have done a lot of uh, mobile vans in India Already a lot of mobile vans work has been done in India and uh, still going on in uh, stage two. So we have done in 27 districts in India where our van is there, which is equipped with the X-ray system, which goes to all the places, does the X-rays, and then it gives an AI-based reporting immediately. And uh, we have launched this van in 2021. Apart from that, we have now bring the cutting edge technology in India with the Neura centers, which is basically uh, screening centers for the top 10 cancers. And here we do the lung screening at a very, very low dose. And every yearly basis that uh, screening is required. So, uh, and they're not only for the uh, uh, breast cancer or all top 10 cancers, we are doing this screening. And uh, we have a center in, uh, the first center was opened in Bangalore, then Mumbai, then Gurgaon, and now Hyderabad center is opening. So we have a plan to open 100 such centers for screening to increase the behavior of uh, uh, testing every yearly basis in India. So these were the centers. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, sir. Now I would request Dr. Deep Jodi Das, Head Medical Planning and Operations, Assam Cancer Care Foundation, to please present his special address with all of us. So, uh, there's a PPT. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, actually, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and SHM for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to present whatever work we are doing at uh, SAM. Uh, so, thanks again. Uh, so, uh, last year also actually we represented uh, and we presented our unique uh, distributed cancer care model that we are doing at Assam. Uh, so, I will not go into those details, but uh, this time actually uh, I would like to more focus on, on the topic that is lung cancer. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to actually give you an overview about uh, our, our uh, work that we are doing. So, right now we are actually operating seven hospitals and three more hospitals will be uh, soon added uh, in the next four to five months. So overall we'll be having 10 hospitals uh, to the tune of around 1500 bed capacity across Assam. And these are all cancer hospitals. Uh, so these are all hospitals which are part of uh, Assam Cancer Care Foundation, which is a section eight company uh, formed in collaboration uh, between government of Assam and Tata Trust. So, uh, so this out of these ten hospitals, uh, seven are currently operational, and uh, three more will be added uh, uh, in the next six months. And then there will be 
seven more hospitals that will be coming up in the next three years, so overall 17 hospitals. In addition to that, we will be also coming up with a uh, research center, uh, uh, cancer research center, which will be a, another 800 bedded facility. So that way we'll be adding around 3,500 beds total, uh, specifically dedicated to cancer. So uh, these are a few highlights about uh, the program uh, uh, that we are doing, like uh, we have done more than uh, one lakh actually OPDs in the last one year. So we started uh, uh, to on 28th of April 2022. So since then we have done more than one lakh 18,000 OPDs, cancer OPDs per se. We have done 23,000 chemos and we have done more than one lakh radiation fractions. Also we have done other things like uh, uh, along with actually cancer, we also need to understand that the places where we are actually working, uh, so those places also need a lot of other, other supports, like many of the places don't have CT or MRI facilities also. So that way, it's not just cancer, we are also able to support uh, diagnostic facilities for those areas, like many people, non-cancer patients also come and avail CT and MRI facilities in our centers. So, so this is it, and when actually I go specifically to cancer data in the ACCF ecosystem, so uh, this is what actually found uh, from the patients that have, those who have visited us in the last uh, one and a half years. So the, the most common cancer that we are seeing in the patients are head and neck cancers, uh, followed by upper GI cancers, then breast, and the fourth largest cancer group is lung cancer at 8%, then lower GI, GB, cervical, and liver and pancreas. So again, this, all these data are actually based on the ACCV ecosystem. So we have seen uh, uh, trends of uh, mainly male-dominated uh, lung cancer pattern. Uh, at the same time, stage-wise, if you see, then most of the patients are again coming at third or fourth stage and presenting to us. Somewhere around 65 patients, 65% 65 of the patients are coming in third or fourth stage. So again, that is something alarming. And as part of ACCF, we have, uh, we have committed ourselves that we are going to reverse this ratio. That is, current ratio is around 70 to 30, wherein 70% of the patients are getting diagnosed in third or fourth stage. So we wanted to reverse it and we wanted to make it 30s to 70, wherein we are able to diagnose 70% of the patients in the first or second stage. And we have taken a target of five years, next five years, wherein we will be trying to reverse this ratio. Age-wise, again, if we see the distribution, then uh, most of the patients are above 51 and uh, 51 years. Uh, again, uh, I also would like to mention about uh, one of the projects that we are doing at QRI for lung cancer. So uh, uh, this project has been running since uh, more than the last six months. And we have been able to uh, uh, identify 20 plus, 29 plus patients for nodular opposities using QRI, and another 13 plus patients for abnormality in radio reporting. So that way, we have been able to at least detect 50 plus patients through this QRI model based on 5,000 screening. So that way, it's a very big number. And this we are running in one of the centers as a pilot. Other than that also, if we look at the profile of lung cancer patients, so uh, most of the patients actually are uh, uh, basically, uh, earlier what was happening was that many of the patients, because of the lack of uh, services, cancer-related services, they were all moving out of the uh, uh, basically state. They were going to Mumbai, Chennai. But one good thing that we have seen is, uh, we have seen a lot of patients, if you see the, the, the brown color, a lot of patients now are coming to us after getting treatment from outside, if you see that. So this is a very good trend because the very reason of putting up this whole uh, ecosystem was to stop patients from going outside. As all of you know that uh, cancer, is, uh, uh, cancer requires treatment which is very prolonged. And that way it may not be sustainable for someone to go outside and do the treatment. So that way this is something, a good healthy trend that we are seeing, that more and more patients are coming and getting treated with us after they, they, they started the treatment somewhere else. Uh, at the same time, if we look at the outcomes, then uh, uh, there, are, uh, there is something alarming that we were seeing was loss to follow-up. So around 6% 6, 6 of the patients we were seeing were loss to follow-up. We are not able to actually catch up with them and then maybe after a few cycles or maybe a few sessions, they stopped coming. So, so when actually we, uh, we, uh, we delved deep into this issue, then we found that 80% of the patients actually were uh, not coming or, or we lost to follow up because of financial reasons. Few others were basically because of the transport related issues around 12% and the remaining were basically because of the issues of fooding and lodging. So, so this was something that we wanted to further investigate 
and as a result actually we also checked ki, uh, what what may be the major reasons so what we found was that uh, travel related actually uh, patients 82% of the patients actually are traveling on daily basis to our centers basically because radiation requires daily traveling so that way uh, there was actually so, so since 82 was a huge number so what we found was that ki, uh, we again wanted to actually find out ki how many patient, how many basically people are accompanying that particular patient because again uh, if you are traveling, then logistics and all those becomes a challenge. What we came to know was another interesting fact is that more than 63% of the patients were traveling with two or more family members. So that way, it was also leading to some sort of a uh, loss of income for, for not just the patient, but also the family members because they were traveling on a daily basis. So that was also putting the economic burden on them. So, uh, so that was another interesting fact. And when we, uh, when we delved deeper, then we also found that average cost per visit, including travel, food, and uh, logistics, was at the rate of 300 plus rupees. Again, that is a very high cost for, a, for, for people from middle class or below middle class income. And th this is the daily, daily actually, uh, cost incurred by each of, the, each of the patients. So this was something very interesting. And this is something uh, that has to be totally borne by the patient because uh, though government is having schemes like AAA, PM, Java, but then that is totally focused on the treatment part, but not taking care of the non-medical expenses. So this was something uh, that was alarming. So that's why actually we came up with this patient support uh, system, wherein actually we went to donors, we explained our issues uh, about, about the, the support needed for uh, this type of non-medical expenditures. At the same time, uh, we, we got... Uh, a few donors actually who came forward to the tune of uh, 40 million rupees that we have received uh, the, 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 in the last one year. And we were able to use it for supporting patients with respect to diagnostic tests. Why diagnostic test is basically because a lot of these uh, government schemes like AAA, PMJ, they don't cover the pre-diagnostic cost. So they only cover post-diagnostic cost. So that way most of the diagnosis related stuff like your uh, biopsy, etc., are not getting covered under this uh, government schemes. So that way, we also thought of supporting these patients for this type of pre-diagnostic test like PET CT or maybe a CT MRI or maybe BAPC. So we were able to support around 290 such patients in the last uh, uh, one year. We also uh, supported patients towards their miscellaneous expenses like transportation, fooding, lodging also. And at the same time, we also supported patients for their treatment because uh, again, there are many patients who who have uh, who are drained with respect to their finances, in spite of having uh, the, the the government schemes or maybe insurance. So we are able to support those patients also. Uh, so so this is what actually we did in terms of patient support. And if I summarize, then uh, uh, basically uh, overall, because of this particular. Uh, uh, nature of partnership between government of Assam and Tata Trust. Uh, the, the one one the highlights is that ki we don't require to have a return on capital invested. This is something very very unique actually, and and that also leads to the affordable type of pricing that we provide to our patients. Just to give an example, uh, a, a typical IGRT uh, cost us less than one lakh rupees in our setup. Whereas if you go outside, then it will be at least two point five to three lakh rupees. Typical IGRT means it's a radiation therapy treatment for around 25 to 30 cycles. So it's one third of the cost. And at the same time, we are also looking at uh, uh, using more and more of the, uh, ex uh, the, the upcoming technologies. For example, uh, recently we have done a tie up with Navya and, and they are doing a lot of, uh, they are the, and, and we are actually running it as a pilot in one of our centers, wherein uh, uh, they are helping us with respect to tumor board meetings. Uh, at the same time, QRI I have already, already mentioned, and we are also doing uh, some research-based collaborations with IIT Guwahati. That also we are doing uh, in terms of uh, availing faster diagnostic kits for some of our cancer patients. Uh, furthermore, I'd also like to actually inform you that uh, we are also looking at a very uh, 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 at a project with the government wherein we are planning to screen one crore population in the next three years. Again, that is a very big target, but then. We have set up our targets and goals, and we hope that we'll be able to screen one crore population in the next three years. Uh, furthermore, there are a few other challenges like a reporting challenge for, for radiology. For that, we have come up with a, our own tele-radiology center to cover all these locations. Soon, we'll be coming up with a tele-pathology center also. So these are a few of the things that we are doing and we will be doing in the upcoming future. And uh, 
I hope that uh, uh, more and more patients, not just from Assam, but across that region will be able to get benefit from us. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I would request Dr. Yutaro Sitoya, team lead, non-communicable disease, World Health Organization India, to please present his special address to all of us. Can I have a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Honorable dignitaries on the dais, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, namaskar and very good morning. I'm honored to attend this important uh, conference on behalf of WHO. Uh, lung cancer is a critical health issue that affects the lives of countless individuals across the world. Lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide, accounting for the highest mortality rates among both men and women, with 1.8 million death annually. This is also true in India, where lung cancer comprises of 8.1% 8 of all cancer death each death, as Madam correctly mentioned. Each year, more than 100,000 people, one lakh per people, are diagnosed with lung cancer and claiming their lives. I also lost my grandfather in uh, lung cancer a long time ago, more than uh, 20, 30 years ago. So the impact towards the families and communities are enormous, as it often affects the working age population. And, but there is things we can do. It's crucial for us to remember that most lung, can lung cancer is preventable. Smoking is the leading cause of lung cancer, responsible for approximately 85% of all cases. So through awareness, the education, and collective action, we can make significant strides in preventing and treating lung cancer. And WHO commends India's work on tobacco control with ban of electronic uh, cigarettes, increase in taxes, and most recently on mandatory messages on OTT uh, uh, platform. I was pleased to see, I was watching a Japanese drama on uh, Netflix, and actually on the, in the beginning they said about the harm of tobacco because there was a scene of the person uh, in, the, in the drama smoking cigarette. So we must further intensify efforts to inform our people about the harms of tobacco use. And additionally, exposure on uh, Environmental pollutants and occupational hazards also contributes to the incidence of lung cancer. I came to India in May, about six months ago, uh, and people were talking about air pollution. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I was okay, you know, the sky was blue. But uh, this three, three, two, three weeks ago, I suddenly realized what people are talking about. Especially before I came to uh, India, I was positioned in uh, one of the small island country in the Pacific, a country called Tonga, where there's nothing about air pollution. There was, oh, every day was a blue sky. So I understand that the government, the, both the national and the Delhi government, is taking measures. And also, it is possible, like in uh, Tokyo, where I grew up, uh, used to be, uh, you know, smogs, uh, especially at the winter, where air was like the condition in Delhi. But after 20, 30 years, it's getting much, much better in Tokyo with a lot of regulations. I'm sure that India can overcome this uh, uh, air pollution issue as well. So the primary prevention, such as tobacco control and reducing exposure to environmental risk factors, can reduce the incidence of lung cancer and save lives. But equally important is early detection. Lung cancer is unfortunately often diagnosed at advanced stages when treatment options are very limited. Screening high-risk individuals has the potential to allow early detection and to dramatically improve survival rates. 
and innovation and technology, the theme of this uh, uh, conference, can be used in early detection. From DNA testing and use of AI for detection to telemedicines to increase access. Since I come to India as an NCD team leader, I have been working with the government to strengthen the health and wellness center at the, you know, the, the uh, nearer to their uh, patients' homes. And they could also integrate screening of the high-risk population under the national program on NCD. And collaboration with the private sector is a key, and healthcare finance system is crucial to make this happen. To improve the patient outcome, of course, we must also focus on providing comprehensive treatment to those who are identified as having lung cancer. Access to quality healthcare services, including affordable treatment options, and psychosocial support, and palliative care for those in need should be a fundamental right for every individual affected by lung cancer. I listened to the presentation from Assam uh, with uh, great ex ex uh, uh, interest uh, because those services, these services, should be provided nearer to their home, at least at the, each district level. So I think it was a great ex example. Again, new innovation and Technology is coming up in this area, and uh, the role of research and industry cannot be emphasized more. So it's great to see all of you here gathering to exchange information about this important issue. And I believe India has a strong capacity to lead the world and save thousands of lives. As WHO, we are happy to provide technical support, especially on scaling up those identified and effective innovations across India and to share the knowledge in this region and to the world. Thank you once again for the invitation, and I hope you have a successful meeting today. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, before we proceed towards our concluding remark, we are open for the question-answer round. I would again request you all to please raise your hand, identify yourself and your question, and then we can proceed with the particular panelists you want to have your question with. Can we please have the mic? Hello, I am Ruvinder Singh. I am technology expert. Sir, my question is to Mr. Sibyl. Sir, uh, when we are doing, you know, uh, ultrasound or something, you know, uh, particularly this um, um, uh, magnetic, you know, technologies, you know. So, you know, I got one head X-ray. So, you know, I was put in the machine, and in another few seconds, you know, I would I would have gone to, through the entire thing. So what is the additional cost, you know, if I'm going to have a head x-ray? And what is the cost of, additional cost of full body scan? MRI, I don't know what is MRI, what is it? What is it? What is it? Sir, how much of the cost is it? Because when I did it, I had a little accident, so I had to prevent it. तो मैं सोच रहा था अगर पूरा हो जाता तो मुझे जो है ना और मेरी बॉडी का भी जो है ना उसमें नहीं हमारा जो न्यूरोलॉजी सेंटर है गुड़गांव में है तो उसमें 15,000 रुपीस फॉर मेन दिस पैकेज इस देर फॉर 10 कैंसर्स ऑल 10 टॉप कैंसर्स स्क्रीनिंग प्रोटोकॉल है ओके ओके उसमें सारा आपका no, it's different. Some other tests might be there. But there are all pathological tests. It's about 2000, sir. That will be separate. But this is different. Like in the Gangaram Hospital, sir, can you tell me? Thank you. The cost is different.
Hello, uh, I am Dr. Jagdish uh, Shivari, uh, professor and ex-scientist ISRO. Uh, sir, I have a general question. Uh, what uh, specific innovation practices and uh, smart decision technologies are being incorporated by the government and uh, private hospitals for the placement of the cost-effective artificial lungs? Your question is from whom? I, should I repeat the question? Oh. Yeah. Please, uh, what uh, specific innovation practices and uh, smart decision technologies are incorporated by the government and the private hospitals for the placement of the cost-effective artificial lungs. Means uh, if it is uh, too much defective uh, due to cancer or due to other reason, then uh, artificial lungs are required. So how the replacement cost-effective is done? General question. Just passive question like regarding screening or total treatment or what's artificial lung care. Artificial lung care. There is no artificial lung right now available in the world. Yeah, you know, because what you say about somebody's lungs have failed, then like somebody's kidneys have failed, you can keep them alive on dialysis. Somebody's liver has failed, you can keep give them some artificial life for a few days, then you can eventually they require transplant. Somebody's heart has failed, then they will also continue medical treatment till they get heart transplant. Similarly, if there is lung failure or say respiratory failure, then ultimately you require lung transplant with nothing like in between that, and there is some lung, artificial lung, you know. So, right now no artificial organ is available, you know. Um, like we have got vital organ, brain, heart, lungs, liver, and kidney. None is available right now. That is something like a artificial organ. But yes, except that you have got something to support on a longer basis kidney failure that you can have support of dialysis. And no work is also going on something like an artificial lung right now. My name is R.K. Das, Director of USDP. It's a non-profit company. So this is regarding uh, long-term occupational exposure, uh, which we don't uh, talk, just like uh, there are many workers and laborers who are in a long-term basis permanently uh, throughout life. Uh, they are engaged in a particular profession, like, uh, say, chemical paint brushing, or industrial uh, workers who are uh, permanently throughout life exposed to industrial fumes. Fumes which are not visible, we don't talk about that. So whether we should make some guidelines for the workers uh, to use uh, certain, uh, could be medically licensed masks or any other measures, or it is already in place, I'd like to know that. Yeah, there are not well-defined policies, but you can say there is education. Like uh, there are a lot of industries which expose you for certain lung can cancer, like lead industry or some other industries. Many people will be able to answer here. And similarly, there is a lot of emission of smoke somewhere, then lung cancer will be there. But I think uh, these are called occupational hazards. We are talking of cancer only, but there are occupational hazards are on even your mental health, physical health. So as such, uh, every, wherever you work, whenever you work, you know, there are certain occupational hazards and people are educated about that, you know. But it's not possible that uh, somewhere there is a, you know, more, let's say, chance of getting particular cancer, then nobody will work there, you know. Okay. But there are certain rules that you avoid, you wear masks, but you just let them take lung cancer. And if you're working in some industry where a lot of smoke is there or some chemical exposure is there, mm -hmm. you're supposed to wear a mask or et cetera. Long-term exposure, sir. Uh, long-term long exposure, people should be educated that long-term exposure probably people should change the joint, uh, jobs regularly, you know, in those places. 
but unfortunately this doesn't exist uh, you can frame guidelines and for the practice. industries you can frame guidelines for the industries yeah so do it like, yeah. no. like you know you can see that a lot of children in uttar pradesh or the people they are working in the carpet industries right from the beginning they are export to this and they, they are going to have anyway may may not have lung cancer but they are having going to have lung diseases they die very early or premature deaths you know so sure. they are not living their normal life sure. Sure. so there should be education okay. thank you and, thank uh, you sir there are certain guidelines but not something like policy i just like to add something to sir what sir said so when you talk about policies so uh, I have been actually speaking in different forums, and I am taking telling it again and again. So, uh, uh, so actually, one major problem with any cancer, not just lung cancer, is that it's still not part of the notifiable diseases. So, in India, what happens is some of the diseases are notifiable diseases, wherein every institution needs to inform it to the government, like malaria, dengue, all these are notifiable diseases. So that way, we have got a huge repository, means huge data repository. We know what is the trend, how it has been actually there across different locations, etc. But same is not there for cancer. So I have been telling again and again that uh, if we have, if if government makes it mandatory and adds cancer also as part of notifiable diseases, then we will have a very good data. And with that data, actually, even policy decisions, etc., will also be more easier uh, to uh, that can be done. At the same time, uh, uh, cancer is still part of the the NCD means uh, uh, this one. Uh, 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 cancer is still not actually, there is no specific separate policy for cancer. So, so that is another area wherein I think government can work. So these are the two things that I feel are important. One is uh, cancer should be made as part of one of the notifiable diseases. And at the same time, there should be a separate policy for cancer. Uh, I think these two things are important here. I think uh, for the hazardous um, um, workplace, I think there's a code under the Ministry of Labor, uh, occupational, I don't know the name actually, uh, occupational hazard code, and certain uh, hazardous occupation is listed under that. So there is some, uh, and there's, of course, they have to do some provision to protect them. Uh, but I think uh, there's an issue with uh, enforcement, and some of the work is not listed under that code. That's also an issue. And also other issues that it, it only uh, applicable to the companies and not to the household uh, works. So for example, uh, from tobacco um, um, prevention con control uh, uh, point of view, we have a lot of BD rollers. Who BD rolling is not listed under this hazardous work code. So one thing we need to put the, that in the code. But also many of this is actually doing at home, so they're not uh, protected by that law or code. So I think, uh, yeah, there's some provision by the, the, by the Ministry of uh, Labor. Sir, this is Ashok Arora. It's a medtech company. And we have a solution for lung cancer detection with AI CAD, which can be used by any city, close LDCT. And can be, can be done with the largest, within three to four minutes, or within minutes even. And with the automatic report, along with RADS score. Similarly, we have for thyroid cancer, same for USB mode di di ultrasound only images. And then we have a cervix gene for cervix cancer also detection as well as. Plus, if there's a lung cancer, we can treat with a microinvasive laser ultrasound guiding as well in a minor OT and anesthesia, local anesthesia maybe. There are more cancers which can be treated with microinvasive laser, percutaneous laser. That's it, sir. We can provide the software for trial also to anyone, or for government even. Thank you. More questions? No, we have more questions at the back. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Kavar from Key Healthcare Private Limited. Uh, my question to panelists is how long do lung cancer patients uh, live with the treatment? Your question is what? To panelists, anyone can answer. Sorry, can you repeat? 
Uh, my question is, uh, how long do you know uh, the lung cancer patient live you, with you the treatment? You will be listening the later, and people are going to give lecture. They will be speaking on this, you know. It actually depends on the stage of diagnosis. So, if you are diagnosed at the third or fourth stage, then obviously your prognosis becomes poorer, and then your your basically lifespan obviously will be lesser. Post treatment, there are more chances of recurrences. Yeah. But still, but if the patient is taking a I mean, stage, stage 3 or stage 4 patient with the treatment, it you know, also how depends long? on the type of cancer. Like in in short, cancer. I give you an answer. If you get in early detection, that is why early detection what he's saying is very okay. important. If you get early detection and if that lesion is resectable by surgery, then that is the only treatment choice which can offer to majority of patient a, life, a long life, you know. So even in those patients, sometimes there are chances of metastasis of spreading later on in life, you know. But if the lung cancer has already spread and it is not, uh, uh, you know, resectable, mm -hmm. then the prognosis is very poor. You will be listening to a speaker here. Even with so-called targeted therapy, which costs in lakhs, the maximum longevity will be less than five years for average. So that is what is uh, any this whole true by sorry many cancers, but especially true for lung cancer, you know. If it is a localized cancer and resectable, then almost you have sometimes you almost curable, you know. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yogendra. I'm from MGM Healthcare. Uh, sir, my question is that 70% uh, of our lung cancers are non small cell lung uh, carcinomas. Uh, and uh, I mean, when you are diagnosing a patient with NSCLC, you need a lot of uh, diagnostics uh, up front. Uh, so, uh, you know, as at a policy level, uh, when uh, India has a lot of incidence of tobacco chewing, we see a lot of head and neck cancers, whereas we thought that uh, uh, people in the West, our Western cohort, smoke tobacco, so they have, uh, they are more predisposed to uh, uh, these lung cancers. So I will ask, uh, I want to ask uh, the WHO representative that what at the policy level, you know, you are, you are, your thoughts are in your mind for cessation of smoking in, in our country to bring down the incidence of lung cancer. And uh, in continuation of that, my second cancer is in our in our settings, we see patients who are very late presenters. You know, by the time they come, they have these inoperable tumors. We can't subject them to VATS. Uh, uh, that is uh, the video-assisted uh, thoracoscopic surgeries for lobar resections. And uh, even the immunotherapies is very ex uh, is very expensive. So we have representative Dr. Gupta is there. So what at the from the corporate uh, hospitals are doing in terms of palliation, in terms of uh, uh, offering uh, you know the palliative care to these uh, non-operable lung lesions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I cannot uh, talk on behalf of the government, but I think uh, um, still the uh, reducing smoking is one of the best ways to prevent. And uh, I think the government of India has, is leading the world in this area, and the smoking rate is decreasing. Of course, as many of the hospitals and you know, maternal child care is getting better in India, people are living longer than before. So there's more people who, who will be diagnosed with lung cancer, but the smoking rate is decreasing and I think it is uh, getting the impact. Uh, so I think uh, there's of course mo many more things we can do, but uh, I think uh, 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 India is putting a lot of effort in these areas and I co as WHO I would comment that um, um, uh, effort by the uh, uh, India government. In terms of assessment, yes, uh, the uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of India is putting a lot of, recently putting a lot of effort in strengthening the Health and Wellness Center. I understand that was renamed very recently, but uh, so there was more than uh, 160,000 uh, Health and Wellness Center across uh, uh, um, India established. And the uh, Ministry of Health is putting effort in integrating NCD care, non-communicable disease care, into that. Currently, focus is more on hypertension and diabetes control because that's the number one killer. So we are doing assessment on uh, uh, blood pressure and blood sugar at the Health and Wellness Center so that they can uh, diagnose and uh, controlled and, you know, uh, um, to reduce the um, reduce uh, uh, premature death. 
So, and, but uh, they're also working on cancers to have uh, early uh, detection of cancer. So I think uh, lung cancer detection could be also integrated into the system. Thank you. Uh, we are going to have the last question. I request yes, the mic. I have a question. Is lung cancer curable in India? Your question is with? Any panelist. You know, there are so many diseases which are only treatable, not curable. And as far as your specific question is concerned, that is lung cancer curable, I just answered. If it is localized, that is only localized to lung and a part of lung. And if that portion can be removed surgically, then it is also almost curable in majority of patients. In minority, still people may have problem later on. But if the lung cancer has spread or any cancer has spread in the body, then only few cancers are curable today. But lung cancer is certainly not curable. You will be listening to speeches later on in, in the session, and they will tell about various therapies, even the targeted therapy, which are very expensive. They can also give only few years of life, maybe three to five years. Um, while for many persons, the lives are only in the months for some time. That is the state of lung cancer. And this whole truth for so many cancers, you know. There are only few cancers, like some few bloody cancers, which are uh, almost curable today. But many, we are, that is why we still bird cancer. We are fighting. We have improved the lives of people, but uh, in a country like ours, a developing nation where the economy is not very good, you cannot afford chemotherapy also. So these are the real okay. story that cancer is still a deadly disease. Uh, I would request the mic on very first table. This is going to be the last question for this session. Can we have the mic here on the very first table? Don't worry, we have two more sessions, and you will have ample opportunities to ask more questions with our panelists. So, uh, this is Dr. Kavita Munchal. I'm from educational background. So I'm basically assistant professor at MIT University. So first all of all, I'm very thankful to organizer that they have started uh, inviting uh, people from educational department also. So my question is that like there are so many factors we, which we are discussing about the lung cancer, like occupational diseases and toxins. But what about the family history? I just want to know the early detection stage. Like it can be detected at an early stage when, uh, when a female is pregnant. Is it any detection method for that? Your question I mean, is it, with? Uh, any panelist can answer. Yeah. No issue. Okay. Okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your questions. Now I would request Dr. D.K. Gupta, co-chairperson, ASOCHAM National Digital Healthcare Task Force, and chairman and managing director, Felix Hospital, to pre please present his concluding remark for the session. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. D.K. Gupta, chairman, Felix Hospital, Noida. It is a both honor and privilege to conclude this enlightening session on from this, all these distinctive uh, speakers on the topic of lung cancer enabling innovation in treatment pathways. On behalf of SHM and myself, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the speakers, all the panelists, all the audience who has participated in, and they share their thoughts, their insight, their strategy, their experiences on this innovation in the treatment pathways of lung cancer. I am thankful. And I am heartful thankful to Dr. Padam Sri Professor D.S. Rana, Ms. Nilima Dubedi, Ms. Chandar Shekhar Sibbal, and Dr. Deep Jyoti Das, Dr. Utaro Sitoya. Uh, last not, but not the least, all the team of SHM who has worked hard for conducting this second conference on lung cancer. We are thankful. And I would like to conclude this session. Based, um, basically, we can divide into four parameters, or four steps how to conclude this session. First, we think, I think already we have all the thing has been discussed. First part with the prevention. Prevention is most important. Like somebody is asking about the, he, she is from education background. The prevention, if we, the, we know the root cause or the high risk is, most common risk is the 
स्मोकिंग क्विटिंग स्मोकिंग स्पेशली प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन एंड सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन कैन बी स्टार्टेड फ्रॉम द स्कूल्स कॉलेज फ्रॉम द यूथ्स एंड देर कैन बी लॉट्स ऑफ मीडिया चैनल्स फ्रॉम विच वी कैन सेंसिटाइज देम टू नॉट स्टार्ट स्मोकिंग दैट द बेस्ट पार्ट थ्रू सोशल मीडिया प्रिंट मीडिया इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया थ्रू सेलिब्रिटी थ्रू एन जी ओज देर आर सो 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 मैनी चैनल्स फ्रॉम वेयर वी कैन स्टॉप दिस प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन वी कैन स्टॉप हियर ओनली सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन प्रिवेंशन आई थिंक ऑलवेज वी हैव टू डू लॉट्स ऑफ कम्युनिटी सर्वे वी हैव टू इन्वॉल्व लॉट्स ऑफ स्टेक होल्डर्स प्राइवेट पब्लिक पार्टनरशिप शुड भी देयर एन जी ओ शुड भी देयर टू डू एक्सेसिवली ऑन दिस पार्ट लाइक सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन वी नो दैट वी आर लिविंग इन एरिया ऑफ कार्सिनोजेंस देर आर कार्सिनोजन एवरीवेयर इन इन द एनवायरमेंट बीइंग वाटर फूड और एयर एवरीवेयर इज ए कार्सिनोजेंस इफ वी लिमिट दीज कार्सिनोजेंस स्पेशली वी टॉक अबाउट दिल्ली एन सी आर वी आर लिविंग इन द गैस चैम्बर देर आर लॉट्स ऑफ कार्सिनोजन दो जो आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द लंग कैंसर ऑल्सो एंड एयर पॉल्यूशन इज सेवरल टाइम्स गिव्स हाई रिस्क फॉर द डेवलपिंग द लंग कैंसर हु आर इवन नॉन जेनेटिक हैविंग नॉन जेनेटिक हिस्ट्री ऑल्सो और नॉन स्मोकर्स ऑल्सो तो आई थिंक दिस prevention on limiting exposure of carcinogens is most important maintaining healthy diet maintaining a healthy diet physical activity regularly we should do and protecting against air pollution i have already explained screening for high risk that's the most important thing like screening is for us early detection that is a prime objective for screening and if we target if we categorize if we screen all the high risk people then we will definitely do early diagnosis and early treatment and somebody was asking that it should it will be curable if it early diagnosed and early treated because it is surgically we can remove that part of lung and that, that is possible if we talk about early screening there are lots of method i think enablement is we talk about innovation ai is there artificial intelligence is there machine learning is there we have robotic surgeries we are doing uh, ar and vr so ai and machine learning can help already i think mr chandar has explained they, they have equipment uh, they, the ct scan radiology that can be enabled through artificial intelligence and machine learning for quick and specific and early diagnosis and the uh, like specific diagnosis of lung cancer especially low dose ct scans are available biomarker research like non little non invasive procedure from where we can take out blood and we do can do maximum test based on their uh, cancer markers or cancer marker specific to lung cancer so early diagnosis can be done based on biomarker biomedical research high risk criteria can be done routine health checkup should be emphasized especially in smokers and youths and risk assessment should be done based on family history based on genetic makeup based on the lifestyle based on the carcinogens exposures diagnosis i think diagnosis is the most important early diagnosis is the most important part if we do early diagnosis based based on imaging techniques like we have ct mri thoracoscopy endoscopy there are so many equipments available for the early diagnosis and liquid biopsies are available we have like it is a little non invasive procedure from where we can do uh, like biomarkers we can identify and based on these biomarkers we can uh, detect early lung cancer molecular profiling it will help in precision medicine it will help in targeted target medicine based on genetic profile of a person and based on genetic makeup if we have see, they have some genetic history or genetic mutation is there so that will help in um, the molecular profiling will help in that histopathological we all know bronchoscopy we all know needle aspiration we all know staging is most important if it diagnosis early stage it is curable treatable if it uh, regular monitoring if it it in late also diagnosed for recurrence like recurrence if we do regular monitoring that also will help in the uh, patient care latest treatment modalities are available like targeted therapies In examples are egfr alk rossi uh, they, they are all linked to genetic mutation somebody was asking about the genetic and family history precision medicine molecular profiling and genetic testing identify specific tumor genetic alterations to do we are now able to do precision medicine for lung cancer also liquid biopsies are liquid biopsies are there combination therapy that includes immunotherapy chemotherapy targeted therapy the, the modality single and combined modality can be used for the better patient outcome also innovation radiation therapy are there like sbrt that is histotactic body radiation therapy these are the special technique like uh, modalities from which we can improve the outcome of patient last and last last point i would like to assess uh, i would like to um, uh, like uh, to tell the cancer vaccines cancer vaccines are right now in developing phase and maybe in next decade on this decade we can have cancer vaccines they will be like quite helpful but they will be helping in the prevention and early like uh, early control of the, this lung cancer thank you so much once again the all the sochm team and all the eminent speaker thank you so much
thank you very much sir and thank you to the to all the panelists for joining us for this session i would request you all to please join us for a group picture Thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause, please? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Akshay Jain, Joint Director, National Health Authority, GOL, will be joining us in the coming session. Moving towards our second session, Lung Cancer Treatment, Innovation in Therapy, and New Frontier. I would request our next session panelist to please join us on the dais. I would request Dr. Sudhir Kalhan, Chair, Chairperson, Asucham National Digital Healthcare Task Force and Chairman, Institute of Minimal Access, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, Sri Gangaram Hospital, to please join us on the dais. Associate Professor, Department of Radiation Oncology, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. Welcome, sir. Dr. Rohit Ramchandra Galute, Director of Marketing, Oncology, MSD Pharmaceutical Private Limited. Dr. Sachin Kumar, Scientist to Department of Medical Oncology. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Institute, Rotary Cancer Hospital, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. Dr. Mukesh Patigar, Unit Head, Medical Oncology, Artemis Hospital, Gurugram. Dr. Ash, uh, Dr. Akshay Jain, Joint Director, National Health Authority, Government of India, will be joining us very soon. I would request Dr. Sudhir Kalan to please present his welcome address to all our panelists. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of SOCHAM and our learned panelists, I welcome you all to a very important and relevant topic. We all know that lung cancer is something which is best prevented. And I think the second chance would be an early detection and treatment. Because if we can detect it early, we can treat it and properly aim towards a cure. A late presentation of lung cancer can be disastrous. And I think at that present time, if you detect it late, it can probably only be limited and treated to prevent as much life expectancy as possible. So today, we are going to have a very uh, meaningful discussion on lung cancer. And uh, in this panel discussion, we have divided basically into three, four uh, parts. And the most relevant part first would be that uh, how can we prevent the disease? How can we, you know, limit or... And then we will be talking about how can we detect it early, can we do some screening, are there some predisposing factors, are there some genetic uh, predispositions. And then once you have the disease, how do you confirm the diagnosis, then how do you, you know, stage the disease, and depending on the stage, what would be the treatment options, which broadly all of us know are basically surgical, uh, medical and uh, radiation oncology. Uh, there are advances in all the fields, there are advances in surgery. Now we have the robotic surgery, which is a little more precision control. Instead of big thoracotomies, you can have smaller incisions. In radiotherapy, there are a lot of advances. In medical oncology now also, there is a lot of advances in terms of targeted chemotherapy, immunotherapy. And I'm quite sure all of you must be wanting to know exactly uh, what are the advances, and we like to discuss with that. So I think I open my uh, discussions 
first uh, i would invite uh, my first speaker dr abhishek Shang, uh, shankar who is an associate professor department of radiation oncology all in institute of medical sciences dr abhishek is also you know a lot done a lot of work on the burning question which all of us want to know is how is the environment affecting us i think Delhiites are really worried about this we are living practically in a gas chamber and even a non smoker in delhi is smoking 20 to 30 cigarettes because of the pollution which is there so dr abhishek i like you to open the session tell us can we do something about the environment can we do something about the pollution and why we are not shaking the government and asking them to do something about it yes dr abhishek. i have it Okay, so thank you, SHM, for this uh, opportunity. And sir is telling Delhi people are very much worried, but probably they are not doing anything. And that's what we have worked hard for the last 50 years to make the situation, what we are facing on daily basis. And we should have worked, you know, we have to work in the same way like we have polluted this environment. In the next 50 years, with the same intensity and the same intentions, that we had it. So I'm Dr. Abhishek. I work at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So apart from treating patients, I have a special interest in doing something for the community-based cancer care, especially in you know, air pollution and the lung cancer. So disclosure, I don't have any relevant financial relationship to disclose. And for the technical disclosure in the chart GPT era, I don't have used chart GPT for making this presentation. And probably in the selfie era where people are very passionate, even some people are not you know, minding giving their life to take a selfie. So probably in, in this today's era, I'm diving into lung cancer screening because lungs also deserve a good selfie some point of the time in a year. So, <clears throat> so this is what rising lung cancer incidence. And the people who are sitting in the room must be thinking that this air pollution will not affect them. And nobody is doing anything except discussing in the closed room. And this is a one-day discussion. People have certain responsibility. And this is the second time. But I want this momentum should go all around the time, otherwise any, now you know that cancer is a disease of household. You go to any family, I don't think that any family is now spurred, you know, with cancer. You can see it. So risk factor, we used to say tobacco, 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 and 95% of the lung cancer was attributed to tobacco. But now with the changing scenario, now you can see the 20% is now acquired by air pollution. So today, if I say in India, lung cancer, is 80%, 75 to 80% is attributed to smoking, and rest 20% is by air pollution, which we are exposed to our life daily. And you know, when Indian is a very proud, <coughs> we are fighting China with the best of our ability. You know, what is the, who, which country is the most populous country in the world? India. So pollution was all over by China people, and they used to be very famous for the pollution-related thing, but now, 61 out of 100 most polluted places on this earth belong to India. So we are very proud Indian that we, whether you talk about pollution and population, we are number one in the world. So as a doctor, I'm very much worried because it comes with a very happy risk of, you know, disease related to air pollution. Lung cancer is one of them. So there are many components which causes lung cancer. So <clears throat> I have just, noted down what is the problem in india there are incidences of cancer in worldwide is very very high but you see the mortality to incidence ratio it's highest in asia and if i talk about india and again highest in asia is in india because of our lack of resources lack of you know uh, awareness to the people there are multiple reasons on the right side i have related the air pollution related death 6.5 million low and middle income country where India belong to is 85 percent and in India it's 2 million around 20 lakh people die because of air pollution every year in India and I think there is no hesitation if you talk one point to a politician or any Baba all the people will be on Jantar Mantar which is very near to this place for the four or five days but have you seen any agitation for the two important cause of death in India which is preventable air pollution and tobacco I have not seen any agitation any protest on the road for the air pollution and <clears throat> this. 
सरकार काम विथ ऑड एंड इवन एंड यू पीपल आर ऑल फॉर्गेट एवरी थिंग अबाउट ऑड एंड इवन सो आई आर क्लासिफिकेशन इफ यू आर एक्सपोज टू एयर पॉल्यूशन योर चांसेज ऑफ डाइंग फ्रॉम द एयर पॉल्यूशन रिलेटेड डिजीज इज वेरी हाई सो नाउ वी कैन सी आवर कुलीग आर डेवलपिंग लंग कैंसर दे आर नॉन स्मोकर दे हैव नो फैमिली हिस्ट्री ऑफ स्मोकिंग इन देयर फैमिली बट दे आर नाव हैविंग लंग कैंसर सो इफ यू डोंट फाइंड एनी थिंग फॉर यूर ओन लॉस इट इज ऑल यू कैन एट्रीब्यूट टू द एयर पॉल्यूशन so air pollution this is the component so this is an important study if you want to know more about this this is published in the cancer ca which is a very famous journal now we know about the pathogenesis of air pollution and cancer how air pollution causes cancer you can understand with this sachin will tell more about this in the panel discussion so these are the diseases which is caused by we used to say diabetes causes you know damage to from head to toe but you can say air pollution doesn't spare any organ in your body and over the period of time we are coming more and more about this and it is more scary when you see the side effects of air pollution being an oncologist you know in terms of cancer which is a very fatal and you just live in delhi where you always see the air pollution aqi is very very high this are the study we just published environmental and occupational determinants of lung cancer in tlcr and this says the target mutations is very high in lung cancer among non smoker when compared to the smokers so there is a need to define high risk group for like cancer we can say this is the high risk group in relation to smokers but when it comes to air pollution can somebody say this is the high risk low risk mid intermediate risk and the you know potential worry is when i say about the oral cancer we know about the multiplicative effect in terms of smoking and alcohol when it comes to air pollution nobody knows and nobody has it ever studied that what will be the multiplicative effect of air pollution in the people who are smoking and living in delhi the people who are smoking and a smoker and taking alcohol and living in delhi so this multiplicative effect is very very must be very very high because now we can see and next 10 years i can see this will be the epidemic of cancer delhi will be one of the you know place where you will see rise in the number of cancer cases breast cancer recently reported a one study from university of leon they have said that in 10% rise in pm 2.5 10 microgram per meter cubic there is a 28% increase in breast cancer cases so all the male and female one thing that you can do you can put you know to prevent from pm 2.5 and 10 exposure please use you know n95 mask it will not prevent the gas exposure but probably yes for pm 2.5 and 10 it is an effective strategy for prevention so raising awareness is very very important these are the study i have quoted for the chest radiography sputum cytology is no more use for the lung cancer screening only thing which saves you from <coughs> mortality benefit from lung cancer screening is low dose ct scan so these are the initial trial with the uh, chest x ray with or without sputum cytology but this is no more it's absolute now so these are the few trials with the single uses ct scan they all said if you go for the lung cancer screening with the ct scan it helps you to detect the disease at early stage but nobody no studies commented on the survival benefit then it is very important when we, i talk about screening there should be any test which helps you to reduce the mortality from that particular cancer that is what the basic aim is so this important study says that if you go for the lung cancer screening with low dose ct scan there is a mortality benefit of 20% so after this there was a paradigm shift in the lung cancer screening so now this is a standard one second this is a nelson study which is a belgium dutch study which said that if you go for the lung cancer screening at the annual basis there is a mortality benefit of 26% in male and I, it is beyond my doubt that if you if women are going for lung cancer screening can you understand the mortality benefit was 20 61% but i will not promote women to smoke because there is a benefit of lung cancer screening so please don't smoke because there is a benefit of these are the two important study china study and i think i got a chance to review for their paper for the wclc and they have shown at 5 years the mortality benefit is 19% so these are the three trials which established the role of lung cancer screening using low dose ct scan this is <coughs> so when to do it this is the when you are a smoker and you have a smoking history of 20 pack years how do you calculate it if you take 
one packet cigarette for one year, this is one pack year. If you take two packet cigarette a day, there are other indicators in India, we use it, smoking index. But this is the standard one, so if your smoking history is 20 or more than 20, you should go for annual CT scan, and the age is 50 to 80 years. Unfortunately, these all are based on the data recorded in the Western world. We don't have a single. In fact, lung cancer incidence is increasing in India, mortality is increasing in India, and probably with, if you see the trend, it will increase in the future, but we don't have any trial. So economic impact and cost effectiveness, this is the study which showed that the UK trial, if you go for the lung cancer screening, it's cost effective. It's not, you know, it, uh, very happy on your pocket. And over the period of time, it is a good practice to go for this. And this is the crux. We have summarized all the studies in our one of the publication. So in India, there is no such study. So this is the guideline for the different, and this are the newer modality, and probably this all are not cost effective. You can't go for the pet city all the time. Molecular biomarkers, this has lots of potential. We probably will be starting our biomarker based, uh, you know, using the liquid biopsy trial with the University of Columbia. It's, it's pending with the NIH U01 grant. And these are the other electronic nodes. These are a few of the studies and training. So from the international success story, we need to learn on this. Because nowadays in India, when we can have this, these are the cancer screening program by Government of India. For us, India-centric cancer is oral cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer. But now we need to focus on lung cancer because now it's increasing in number. If you don't act right now, probably it will have very heavy on the human life loss and the financial burden, which is an important concern. So if I say about Indian healthcare structure, this is an important slide. If I talk about healthcare infrastructure, you know 70% of the people in India is insured. Maximum with the, I am not sure how many people are exercising, but on paper, this is 70% of Indian population is insured with some. Maximum with the Aishman Bharat, 20% with the extension scheme that we call it by the state government, CGHS, then ESI has a major work and the personal and the private insurance. So only 30%, which we call is missing middle, middle class, 30% Indian population around 40 crore, they are not covered by any health insurance scheme in India. So improving quality of life is very, if you detect it early, if you go for the treatment, your outcome is better and quality of life better. This is the only trial in India which was started in PGI Chandigarh by Navneet sir. And they said that we always have a worry in view of pulmonary TV, will it increase the false positivity and patient has to unnecessarily go for further testing which will have more trauma on their mental size. They said TV was not associated with the false positivity. So this is a problem, smoking suggestion. We don't see it as a doctor. If I ask somebody, are you a smoker? They say, yes. I say, aage se nahi karna. Is it enough to convince somebody to stop smoking who was smoking for last many years? And now we can see, and polio is the best example I learned. Many management graduates learn from polio, how we have achieved eradication in terms of polio. We need to understand it. But if it comes to the approach which polio took, in India we take it, make advocacy effective. Nobody wants to see the advertisement when they see it. Create demands. We have created demands for the you know, pan masala users and many of the Bollywood celebrity who lost their life, you know, family life to cancer, they are now coming. And now the cricketers also, I don't understand. And we don't know anything. We again are very crazy for those cricketers and the film star. And they are, they are earning from here also. And you know, maximum investment of life insurance company is in which company, which called ITC, Indian Tobacco Company. And that's what I could decode the LIC ad. They say, Jindagi ke saath bhi, Jindagi ke baad bhi. If you are smoking using the ITC cigarettes, money is going to LIC. If you die after that, money is still with the LIC. So media opportunity is all, I, I'm not very media fan because they, 30 minutes for the cancer and rest 23 hours and 30 minutes for the Vimal Gutka, which is not an ideal situation to compare with. So we need to compare implementing suggestion into practice. These are the challenges we know that, and we should not be impressed with the small, small country, which has a, you know, smaller goals to achieve. And we as an Indian is very proud. I can't compare India with New Zealand because we, I'm just finishing. So this is a window of opportunity. So in spite of all the 
against all odds, we need to work out to improve our odds, which is for the country. So I personally feel we need to come together and work on this, because the people who talk in terms of I, I always find them ill. So critical letter. And if you want to make yourself well, you need to talk in terms of we, which is, and health communities have, healthy communities have hope, and those with hope, with hope has everything. We need to be hopeful, and COVID has taught us. And I think if you want to see the bad things about the cancers, please see it, this video. And I think you need to work on this. Otherwise, we are just messing the future of our children in Delhi and all the countries. So we need to work hard to make at least their future prosperous. Thank you so much. This is video for you. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek, for giving a, a very holistic picture to all of us. And I would say giving a very passionate presentation. I remember we had this conference last year also, and we had actually requested SHM that we must have one day full conference on environmental pollution. And we are going to talk only about pollution, and we are going to force the Delhi government and the central government to do something about the, about the pollution. Because as you said in your own, uh, presentation that if anybody is taking 20 cigarettes a day needs a screening, so that according to those parameters, every daily I needs a screening. So it's a very sad situation and it is so bad that people talk about so many things, people, but nobody is actually, I don't see people of Delhi agitating, I don't see the media supporting us. Every time doctors try to do something, you know, and the, the, the pan, gutka and tobacco lobby is so strong that they, they would not let you do anything. I think it is a responsibility that as doctors, as SHM also, I'm speaking on behalf of SHM, we must have a full day conference on environmental pollution and what measures we can take to bring this pollution down. We are actually, you know, trying to ro roger the future of our children because this air pollution is ultimately going to kill them. There is n nothing short of that which they are going to do. So now uh, I would give my mic to... Yes. Please, please. Uh, thank you so much, sir. That was great insight. I would request Dr. Akshay Jain, Joint Director, National Health Authority, Government of India, to please join us. Can I please have a welcome address for him? Thank, thank you so you, much. Sir. I would also yeah. request Dr. Sudhir Kalan to pre please present a very warm floral welcome to Dr. Abish uh, Akshay Jain, please. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Akshay Jain, for joining us. Akshay, thank you so much. And this is a small request from all the Delhiites and all the people to the government of India, the government of Delhi. Please do something about the pollution. <laughs> I would request Dr. Akshay Jain to please uh, present his address to our audience and all our panelists. No, no. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me first thank Ashwachem for giving this uh, opportunity to uh, address uh, this important uh, uh, aggregation of uh, people here. And uh, I also uh, extend my uh, thanks to the panelists sitting on the dais and the participants in this uh, event. I am here to uh, talk about uh, Pradhan Mantri Janarogi Yojana. Pradhan Mantri Janarogi Yojana, as was mentioned by uh, Dr. Abhishek Shankar in his presentation, that it covers around 40% of our population. 40% uh, uh, means 50 crore people. Which is much more, which is much more than population of many of the countries in the world. We we cover them, we give them five lakh rupees uh, renewable wallet, which covers all their family members, irrespective of the size of the family. Out of these universe of the beneficiaries in Pradhan Mantri Janarog Yojana, we have already covered or distributed. 27 crore Ayushman cards to people. So the huge number of, number of beneficiaries who are approaching health facilities. Health facilities, we have both private as well as government. We have 27,000 of them across India. And we are having 45,000, 50,000 admissions per day. Every single day, these many patients are coming to hospitals and taking their admissions. 
Now, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana only covers the secondary and tertiary level care, which was completely out of pocket for as an expenditure. It reduces the out of pocket expenditure burden on so many of people. We know that we have still grounds to cover. Missing middle was mentioned in the earlier presentation. And we also think that uh, to cover these many people, because the topmost population already has a private insurance cover, but some missing middle are there. We need to extend this coverage. We are trying to cover them through inclusion of other schemes like ESIC, CGHS, or CAPF. These independent schemes who are having their own beneficiaries, we are trying to merge them in Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana and make them use our own IT platform uh, in providing healthcare services. Talking about IT platform, let me tell you that this scheme is completely cashless, paperless. All the identification of beneficiaries is completely digital. Uh, currently, in last September, when Honorable Prime, Prime, uh, President of India launched Aishman Bhav campaign, National Health Authority launched an Aishman app. In Aishman app, a beneficiary can identify himself, authenticate himself from the comforts of his home and get his Aishman card uh, without going to any hospital or any common service center. So many developments have happened here and uh, central government as well as the state government in the last five years have spent around 72,000 crore rupees while reimbursing uh, admission patients, ad admission uh, costs of the patients. Talking about lung cancer, what Aishman Bharat scheme has, Aishman Bharat scheme has 20, more than 20 specialties covered and 1949 or 1949 packages, procedures are covered. So what happens, the patient approaches the hospital, he goes there for a, uh, for a treatment and if the treatment is covered in these 1949 packages, he will be provided that treatment uh, with the due care and he will not be charged any single amount and that amount would be reimbursed by the central as well as the state government. So our, among these 1949 or more than 20 specialities that we have, we have surgical oncology, medical oncology and radiation oncology as specialties. And in these oncology packages, we have specific packages which cover lung cancers. So uh, in medical oncology, we cover various drugs which are required to treat patients for lung cancer. In surgical oncology, we have packages, uh, I think more than one lakh rupees, uh, like mediastinal mass excision or resection of the lung. So these kind of packages are covered in surgical oncology also. In medical on in, in uh, radiation oncology, radi radiation oncology, we have around 10 packages specifically for lung cancers. So when people are approaching or lung cancer patients are approaching and they are beneficiaries of Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana, they can take their their treatment in one of the 27,000 impaneled hospitals across India. Let me also tell you that this scheme is completely portable. A patient who is a beneficiary in the state of Bihar can take treatment in other state, maybe UP. A uh, patient uh, from northeastern state can take their treatment in Bangalore. So this is completely portable. And uh, we have very uh, promising numbers in Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana where we see portability happening uh, 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 every, every single day. So uh, while covering patients with lung cancers in Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogi Yojana, we are at constant endeavor to increase the surgical packages and increase their cost so that we have so that we can come to the market price that uh, is currently in the market for the treatment that we have for lung cancer treatments then uh, we have a group of experts with us those experts are regularly consulted consulted to uh, properly rationalize and revise the packages that we have in the last five years of this scheme, we have already revised five times these packages. So we initiated with 1.2, now we are at 2022, so we have revised them five times. We are in the process of revision. In these revision exercises, what we do, we increase the number of specialities, we increase the number of procedures, packages, we rationalize their rate as per the demand of the market because health space is a complex space. Uh, people who are approaching for medical uh, treatment 
they are the end users but the people who are treating them they are doctors they are treating in hospitals payment is being made by the government or the insurance companies so there are different value propositions and value interests of every stakeholder so this is a very complex space that we work into we pay to the hospitals hospital deliver the treatment hospitals pay to the doctors and then uh, so in this complex space we try to make a stakeholder consultation and try to rationalize and revise our packages properly so that uh, we provide a quality and value based care to the people who deserve them deserve it most because pradhan mantri jan aarogya yojana is currently covering the bottom 40% of our indian population so uh, the data on which it is based is uh, so uh, socio economic caste census which was held in 2011 although various revisions have happened after that and various states have taken their own beneficiary base and integrated with the pradhan mantri jan aarogya yojana and integrated their or increased their beneficiary base also so uh, for lung cancers we dedicatedly and try or endeavor to increase the number of package and revise them more so that we are able to provide proper care to cancer patients and uh, i again thank you all for inviting us for this august gathering and uh, uh, we hope to hear more from the stakeholders who are here who are specialist here and uh, hear from them and help us out in more rationalizing the packages thank you so much <clears throat> thank you dr akshay jain who is the joint director of national health authority uh, right at the outset sir i must say that we all really appreciate the amount of work the government of india the ministry of health welfare is doing in the field of health personally i have been associated with with all of you for last 10 years and i have seen the sea change in attitude that the government has towards health now the increase in capex the percentage of gdp everything we can i can see and i think ayushman bharat has been a game changer you know providing health care now at an affordable cost to many people and i think another initiative which the ministry has done the nha has done is that revived the primary health centers almost the primary health centers had become redundant you know there were no people there there was no functioning there there was no screening happening i think that is done and i think the best initiative is the uh, digital health care because that is the only way the rural and urban divide can be you know bridged also the uh, the abha scheme that we have started in which every indian is records are going to be digitized and shared it is there but sir there is one I'm, the government is doing a lot of spending on treating the disease but i come back to the point of prevention one rupee spent at prevention can prevent 10000 rupees at the when the prime minister of india first came at the red fort to talk about his first speech if you all remember he talked about the toilets he talked about swachh bharat and all of us were amazed and you know awestruck that what is he talking about but let me tell you that swachh bharat scheme has brought down the incidence of gastroenteritis in children by more than 60% so it it is amazing so that was the vision that was the vision of the prime minister of india which you know we were all so happy to see that from cure to prevention we have all heard in medical college prevention is the best cure and the government of india very effectively uh, implemented the swachh bharat scheme but sir what about the toilets we are cleaning but what about this environment that we are living in nobody is talking about this environment i think sir we have to create an awareness and at a war footing something has to be done through a ppp model whatever i don't care this is already a war sir i think a war which we are all losing the environment is becoming an issue which is disturbing to us it is changing the future of our children causing a lot of respiratory diseases bringing up lot of cancers and something needs to be done so with that i would you know i would give my the mic to my next panelist dr sachin kumar who happens to be a medical oncologist uh, and uh, i would like to you know ask him what is his opinion about uh, lung cancer today and in terms of prevention in terms of early detection what is your overall uh, opinion about the position of lung cancer today good afternoon uh, yes good afternoon uh, thank you sir so uh, 
just to correct, sir, that I'm not a medical oncologist. I'm a basic scientist who have done, uh, who is doing research on lung cancer for the past 15 years. Okay, so uh, the problem is that everyone is talking about how to treat lung cancer, and Dr. Avisek rightly said that it is not about treatment, it is more about preventing lung cancer, because most of the lung cancer, around 80% of the lung cancer are smoking or tobacco related, and uh, now air pollution is uh, one of the emerging factors for lung cancer. Uh, for the past several dec uh, years, decades, we know that uh, lung cancer is caused by, or many cancers and many respiratory diseases are caused by uh, air pollution. But for the first time in 2023, we have uh, got a biological basis that how this, uh, lung, uh, this air pollution is causing lung cancer. So there is a study which was published recently in April 2023 in a leading uh, journal Nature. And the study was done in Taiwan, in South Korea, in Canada, and in Great Britain, Britain, London. So they found that it is uh, air pollution is not initiating lung cancer. So there are, uh, if we talk about cancer cells, uh, we will be fortunate that we do not have any cells which are defective in our body. We already have many cells which may have genetic, uh, genetic mutations or mutation in our genetic material that is DNA. So those cells which have those mutations, they are lying dormant. And what air pollution is doing, it is triggering or it is just triggering those cells or activating those cells to divide faster and faster. So if we prevent, so air pollution is usually acting as a tumor, tumor promoting agent. It's not a tumor initiating agent, it is a tumor promoting agent. So if we block that axis, or if we block the promotion of this tumor initiate, uh, promoting event, we can prevent lung cancer or many other cancers which are air pollution related. So how, what kind of preventive strategies which we can adopt so that we can block this tumor promoting event? So one of the, uh, of course, one of the uh, thing we can do is to uh, devise strategies so that we can prevent these air pollutions. So that study also pointed out that if those patients here, th those patients who have specific mutations and if they are non-smokers, but if they are living in highly polluted area, they have more high uh, chances of developing lung cancer. And even three years of living in highly polluted area is enough to initiate lung cancer in these patients. So you can see that our, at least four months, October to January, we live in this gas chamber. So three years we can achieve only in five, six years. And we talk about children who are exposed to this gas chamber every day for every year, four to five months. So we are exposing those children, adolescent, uh, so that they can, those events can be triggered and they develop very various respiratory illnesses, including lung cancer, COPD, at very early age. And that is one of the reasons that the median age of developing lung cancer in India is only 50, 55 years, while in the West it is 70 years. So means we are getting lung cancer at least 10 to 15 years early than what is happening in the West country. And that could be due to pollution, that could be due to higher incidence of smoking, uh, secondhand smoking, the occupational, occupational exposures like asbestos, arsenic, cadmium, uh, radon gas. So all these things needs to be prevented. Uh, in the first session, someone was talking about occupational hazards. So yes, there should be policies that people who are working in lead industries, in silica industries, they should be, it should be made mandatory that they wear masks uh, so that the silica exposure, as, asbestos exposure can be minimized. Because we, uh, for some bucks, uh, those people who are working in those industries, they are the lower strata and we do not care about their health. And they are the, the, at the highest exposure of occupational hazards which may ultimately lead to lung cancer at later stages of their life. And will they be able to afford that treatment? I d doubt that they will be able to afford that treatment. Th so thank you. Thank you, thank Dr. Sachin, for giving uh, uh, your uh, opinion. And uh, I think we move from prevention to treatment now. And I request our next panelist, Dr. Mukesh Patekar, who is a medical oncologist at Artemis Hospital, that now we have a patient who is suspected to have lung cancer. Thank you so much, sir, for coming. We understand. I mean, absolutely. So just remember our message, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so my question to Dr. Mukesh Patekar is that now we have a case who's suspected to have lung cancer and needs treatment. How do we confirm the diagnosis? How do we stage it? And what are the treatment modalities available today? Just a brief on that. Um, 
good afternoon everyone uh, good afternoon uh, associate uh, associate for uh, giving me this opportunity basically uh, lung cancer is not a one disease uh, so whenever any patients come to the physician or uh, chest physician pulmonologist with suspicion of the diagnosis of the lung cancer so basically most important thing is uh, imaging of the chest so most of the patients do have a CT scan of the chest as a modality and they sh that shows some mass in the lung. So those patients generally, so for the diagnosis of the lung cancer is depend on the biopsy. So most of the time we need, uh, uh, we need to see what is the location of the tumor in the particular part of the lung. So if it is a central lung cancer or perihilar mass, that time we need a help of the pulmonologist to do a bronchoscopy and get a biopsy uh, from the lung tissue and establish a diagnosis. Sometimes uh, the suspected lung mass is on, the, is on the peripheral surface of the lung. That time we need a intermediate radiologist help to get a CT guided biopsy from lung, uh, lung mass. So this is how establishes the diagnosis of the lung cancer. So why? Because there are other modality. A lot of people think that PET scan is a way to diagnose the lung cancer. PET scan is not a way to diagnose the lung cancer. Basically, it is a modality to stage the tumor. So basically, the diagnosis happens with the uh, biopsy only. Once you establish the diagnosis, then we have to establish the stage of the tumor. And I have heard one question in our previous panel, uh, the survival of the particular uh, patient with lung cancer. Survival definitely depends upon the stage. So once you uh, get a histopathological proven diagnosis, then we'll subject them for uh, the PET scan if it is available. I believe most of the our cities, apart from the metro cities, they don't have PET scanner. So CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis is the modality along with the bone scan. So these uh, two tests help us to get the proper diagnosis uh, stage of the tumor. So then we test for the organ function, like liver function, kidney function, blood parameters. They are very important to plan further therapy. And now the, our, the today's tagline is, what are the innovations are happening in the lung cancer? So as I said, lung cancer is not a single disease. Basically, lung cancer is a two types. One, it is a small cell, and other is a non-small cell lung cancer. So treatment survival outcomes, they are very different. When you talk about the targeted therapy or precision therapy, like our scientists have, a, uh, they have done very great work in the past and, are, and they are doing a future, for future also. So particularly non-small cell lung cancer, basically, uh, particularly adenocarcinoma, which is a subtype where a lot of innovation research have been done. In that, generally, we uh, take out the tumor DNA to, uh, and we take out their RNA and in the lab, with the help of scientists, uh, we do the, some genetic testing to identify any mutation. Like Dr. Sachin just said, ki, uh, the, our body's constant pressure of uh, uh, stress, maybe because of uh, uh, environmental factor or tobacco. So in that case, we might gain some mutations uh, detected. So, Technically, in adenocarcinoma of the lung, if it is stage 4, there is a recommended to test with the molecular testing. We call it as a polymerase chain reaction. Uh, we do NGS. Apart from that, there is an era of immunotherapy. There was a headlines a few years uh, ago on the television that uh, immunotherapy cures the lung cancer. Yes, it is a, a, a dream come true, I would say, at least for the, those patients who had an early stage or they have a high uh, mutation burden or MSI high, this patient can be still cured with immunotherapy drug if they get appropriate drug. So for that, we need to test with PDL1 testing. So this is how summarize the uh, diagnostic approach to the lung cancer. We need organ function test, we need diagnostic test, we need molecular test, and then uh, treatment uh, depends upon the stage. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. I think you have rightly said that there are a lot of advancements which have happened in diagnosis, with the introduction of EBUS, we can, can now get biopsy tissue biopsy quite early. With the uh, high resolution CT scans, PET scan, we can diagnose the treat uh, disease, other, others. Uh, what my question specifically, uh, coming back to you is, sir, that 
you know, India is a country with limited resources. And a common person on the street hears so much about targeted uh, chemotherapy and he hears so much about immunotherapy. And he's shown the moon, you know, he's, he's told that, oh, the cost might be much more, but then there, that is the only ray of hope. So, you know, I feel that sometimes the data are not available to the common person more. So there is information is lacking. He doesn't really know that this patient who's got cancer, should he spend these few lakhs on his targeted chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and are the benefits going to be there? So how does he evaluate that? Whatever innovation research uh, they have happened, basically they, they are happen, uh, on the stage four cancer. So when you talk, talk about the stage four cancer, definitely they are not curable. So mm. that cure word is out. So what depends is how long we can, pay, uh, that patient will going to survive. This depends upon the, this evolution uh, has happened. Basically, uh, when the, there is stage four cancer, that time surgery, radiation, these are out from the equation. Traditional chemotherapy is there, uh, last 50 years mm. we are having some chemotherapy drugs and there are drugs, they have not changed. They are same last uh, 20, 30 years. What have changed? The molecular pathways, like uh, some uh, uh, EGFR mutations, they are happening around 40% non-smokers. But if you uh, uh, carefully heard about your previous speaker, they said that 90% lung cancer happened to be because of smoking. So in that case, we are not going to get any kind of mutation, mm -hmm. like air pollution also. A lot of uh, patients I see in my OPD, uh, they come with the fact that they never smoke, they, they never had any mm -hmm. uh, alcohol, any addiction. Uh, so, so common people have to understand, because this is an uh, opportunity for me also and every person to convey that. Prevention is the uh, word rightly says, we need to decrease the burden. Either tobacco smoking, tobacco uh, suggestion programs, air pollution control, they are more important than focusing on the innovative therapies like uh, targeted therapy or uh, immunotherapy, because these therapy are there for advanced stages. So I think we are all on the same page for regarding yeah. prevention. Nobody is denying that yeah. prevention, early detection and treatment is... My question was very specific. You know, you have a person, a, mid, a middle income family who has got limited resources. We talk to them about targeted chemotherapy, immunotherapy. He spent 30 lakhs yeah. on the patient who is terminally sick. He is not going to survive for two years. And that 30 lakhs he could have used for the education of his children. Yes, so I, I... That's what I want to know. Sir, how will you evaluate that? Basically, sir, uh, whenever some patient, we, we, when we see them in the clinics, then we can we have to make a judgment whether this patient is going to afford this particular drug or not. Mm. Yes, we have to explain all those options to them. And we always insist them, whatever expensive drug mm. you are taking, that is not going to cure. So I think Abhishek on, also wants to yeah, comment on, on this. On the face value, we cannot say he, uh, with this drug, if you take uh, for a year or two and we spend 20, 30 lakhs, you are not going to cure. Hmm. Because even advanced stage also, even stage four also, 10 to 15 percent cancers can get cure. So we are hmm. not going to know which patient going to uh, get long-term so, cure or so not. Very so very tricky situation. Yeah. Yeah. It is a definitely. Uh, you Bishak, you want to uh, briefly. Uh, yeah. Clear-cut communication is very much needed and probably over the period of time, we have lost that communication. There is a lot many, if you see the NCI, they have a patient guide. You name any institution in the country which has a subsequent, you know, frequently asked questions they can answer. There's, you know, patient wants to know, but they are not aware what is the source for their knowledge. So they will Google it and Google gives you information. They will come with some NEJM publication on the first say. Patient will not understand. So we need to have a good data source where patient can read and communication is an important. We need to, and now it is we get so much push from the patient. Mm. If you say that your life is very limited, don't go for immunotherapy. He will go to four other person and somewhere he will get the immunotherapy. So probably this is a very difficult situation so, and it's a personal so choice. So we have to come to evidence-based medicine, basically yeah, evidence-based medicine. You said there is a, I'll just share with, to just make it a little light discussion that in America, there is a joke, uh, that, you know, people say that why do they nail the coffins in America? Always, you see, the coffins are always nailed. Says they do it so that the oncologist can't take him out and start chemotherapy. Because they, they feel it is so bad that they will not, you know, they might just give, a, uh, you know, immunotherapy or anything to even a person who is terminally sick. So I think there is a, some sense of responsibility and it should be evidence-based. Uh, Actually, America, some of, yeah. let me uh, clear that, sir, in USA, other part of the world, there is a, uh, if there is an advanced stage and patient is not fit, they don't treat at all. Mm. But the, uh, that percept is very different in our part. Yes. A lot of people uh, people in our cases, they come with the advanced stage, poor performance status. But, 
we have very limited resources. Yes, that yes, is why I are, yes, you definitely. and you are all experts. Yeah. So that is why I am putting these tricky questions in front Actually, of you. Actually, some of the targeted therapies Scientist. have generic, yes, generic version now. Yeah. So some of the targeted therapies, like for example, EGFR inhibitors, jeftinib or erlotinib, as well as one of the ALK inhibitors, seritinib, they have generic versions now, so which are quite cheaper as compared to the branded ones. So uh, Rohit, and yeah. they are slightly affordable as compared to. We have somebody to from the industry also. Dr. Rohit is here. Dr. Rohit can tell us uh, what is his opinion about. No, absolutely, sir. I think, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the, for the panel discussion and also, Sir Cham, for the opportunity. Uh, I think lung cancer has been the poster child for research uh, across the pharma and plus even, even the academicians because, because of the sheer number of cancer patients we see. Uh, and I think that's why we have seen that because of the heterogeneous nature, we have, we have kind of a lot of targeted therapies. And maybe I think there is also a positive twist to, the, uh, to, to uh, what I say now. I'll just narrate a story in 30 seconds. Uh, and again, uh, anonymized here, I think we have a patient advocate also in the next, uh, next panel, uh, that there was a lady which, with an ALK positive lung cancer. And unfortunately, a uh, lot of drug was were under the development for ALK positive uh, tumor type. But she got an access from uh, an ex-company. Uh, I won't name the companies. But what happened was subsequently, uh, and on compassionate basis, sir, what happened was every time she progressed, there was additional research happened from the first first line to second line to the third line, and all the th all the companies supported her on compassionate basis. So just trying to say that, uh, and she survived for around six and a half years from the first uh, time of diagnosis. Obviously, there was a lot of suffering in between. I think living with that cancer is not easy. Uh, but uh, what also happened in the fact that her son grew from uh, age uh, maybe six months to seven years old. So I think there was substantial change. We can't quantify these, these matters. And, and, uh, and technically also, uh, that research in, invested by uh, definitely academicians and, and pharma led to a substantial development of, of even third line and even, I think, uh, now fourth line ALK, ALK generation of molecules. I think we're focusing a lot on immunotherapy. I represent MSD. A lot of immunotherapy work has gone. In fact, our 10% to 15% of our entire research of 1,000 clinical trials is just lung cancer. Yep. Uh, so I can't emphasize more on what immunotherapy can bring in. In fact, in next session, I'm going to tell about how does it impact over a period of time if we are taking right decisions uh, from a patient-centric uh, centric angle and then even at a policy level. Obviously, but again, that's a fag end. I think ultimate aim is to prevent rather than kind of treat Absolutely. patients. So I think I'll just stop here. Maybe no, I think uh, my request to the pharma industry would be that you people are doing a great job. But uh, you can also help uh, partner all of us doctors and, uh, you know, create a general awareness in the public like many pharma companies are already doing. They are, uh, you know, updating doctors about the newer treatment mortalities. Absolutely. There should also, I suggest, there should be a helpline kind of a thing or a, a portal where anybody who has lung cancer or something, they can probably put in their query over there and you can, you know, guide them to the right people. Because I think anybody uh, today, uh, first when he is diagnosed with a certain disease, first he is in a denial phase. He would like to go to 10 other places to confirm the diagnosis. And once it is, you know, the, probably he is left with no other option but to Google. So he Googles himself and then the Google puts out a lot of articles which sometimes might, might, might be relevant, might not be relevant. I so if, go, we huh? have, if we have companies like you, you providing a helpline, like if you are a leader in lung cancer treatment, immunotherapy, maybe you can start a web portal on lung cancer awareness and uh, treatment modalities and uh, we can circulate to our patients that if they have a problem, they can go on this web portal, they can put in their brief uh, history and, and then they can be guided. So that can be a... a really Absolutely, a sir. I think that's, that's phenomenal what you say. Uh, in fact, we're also doing a lot of social media activations from our side and especially, uh, and Dr. Bishik knows this very well, uh, we did something, a lot of uh, work around HPV on, because it's more, more consumer awareness around HPV and then, because it's a preventable tumor in cervical, but not go there. But for lung cancer, obviously there were little uh, kind of prevention mechanisms which we could take care and obviously we're talking about AQI. But from, as a pharma, I think we're doing a lot of efforts in, in kind of uh, increasing the awareness. Mm -hmm. But the irony of the fact is that, sir, uh, and we talked about FMCG. FMCG has a direct connection to patient, uh, mm -hmm. to, to the consumers, yeah. which will be patient the, after 20, 30 years. But as pharma, we are restricted so much by the, by the regulators on knowing the patient, consumers, uh, talking about, uh, talking directly to the consumers, mm -hmm. where we can create a lot of positive awareness. But within that space, again, uh, uh, our head of comms here is here, Nilimaji. Uh, they have done a substantial effort in 
creating awareness through our social portals, may it be Instagram, may it be Facebook, may it be even, even now, we also have a WhatsApp channel which is approved mm -hmm. now. Uh, but uh, all in all, what I can again say is there is a lot of restriction on pharma because of the negative connotation associated to pharma. I'll not kind of talk about what's the negative side, but, uh, but uh, our, our intent has always been pure to kind of support patients, uh, support right academic research, mm -hmm. and even support awareness. Uh, but again, again, yeah. it boils down to kind of uh, how, okay. how much we also Thank get you. the support from regulators. I request Abhishek to tell us what are the advances in uh, radiation oncology because I remember some time back people used to, you know, afraid of radiation because it was spread over. So many people used to have uh, radiation dermatitis, enteritis and so many things. What are the advantages? With I happening? think I would like to clarify. Whenever you have, you are expecting some effect, there will be side, side effects. effects. Yes. So if I don't find the side effects, I'm really worried about the effect. So it's related to immunotherapy. Radiotherapy should not be an exception. So coming to the points, radiotherapy has evolved over the period of time. Now radiotherapy role is, you know, radically treating lung cancer initial stage and it has a role in locally advanced cancer also both the small cell and non-small cell lung cancer and in the palliative setting that uh, sir wanted to know so it really helps to patient to have pain as a one of the common symptoms with the lung cancer or the primary disease or uh, when there's a metastasizes to the bone or it you know affects the nerve bundle then the second part is it also helps to prevent the complication from the lung cancer, which is the mass. It helps in terms of when you have the obstruction related to the airway, you have obstruction of the blood vessels, and in the bone metastasis, it does miracle. Apart from all this clinical benefit, I personally feel that upment and with the machines, we have less of side effects now, but side effects is there. So now we have moved from the cobalt era to the linear accelerator, and the further is advancement. So this is useful at all the stages of the lung cancer. Is a beneficiary of uh, Ayushman Bharat entitled to get I his think, uh, in the private uh, sector? Ayushman Bharat has revolutionized the cancer care, and lung cancer care is not an exception. I can see 80% of the people who could not have afforded to reach to the hospital, whether it's a private and government, and suck in. It has helped to develop a better, you know, insurance has helped to better healthcare system. If you see Rajasthan, Bihar, where people are, you know, beneficiaries are more, you see the status of the private healthcare infrastructure. Even it's a big boost to the, like, institution like AIMS. They get a good coverage, and people, I think it's, it's the best thing to happen in the last few years. That's for the cancer treatment Absol in the periphery. Absolutely. Ayushman Bharat so has a big been round of applause for yeah. Ayushman Bharat. That's been a game changer. So my, my concluding question to all the panelists, you know, the new kid on the block is digital. Digital healthcare, artificial intelligence. So uh, my question to the panelists is that how can we use technology? India is a leader in technology. I mean, the whole world looks towards India in terms of technology. How can we use technology uh, in the treatment of lung cancer, whether it is prevention, it is screening, treatment, and how can we use digital healthcare to bridge the rural and urban divide. I'm still, it is a phenomenal divide. All the treatment modalities, you have Delhi having 20 corporate hospitals, you move 100 kilometers away from Delhi and you'll see a drop in care. As for the record, 90% of the cancer centers are situated in the metropolitan city, where 70% of the India still live in the rural area. So that's so pathetic. Digital health is an important modality. And you can see the trend during COVID time, it was very much high, but now you can see the trend, it has gone down. Daily consultation in related, and I think many people, management institute are trying, if an FMS is trying to know what are the things that led to increase and what are the reason it is coming down because it's a good mortality. People in periphery comes thousand kilometers to just for get a consultation and follow up how to make it better, but related to the artificial intelligence and machine learning, it is a very, very good tool. Maybe initial difficulty you have, but in letter on, it will simplify your process. You will make a model, an algorithm for everything, and that is, you know, the things of future. So IoT, IoT, Internet of Things, is getting so much of importance, which is making the remote, uh, you know, monitoring of many of the patients. So this all thing must be incorporated, so I, think, I think. Dr. Sachin. Yeah. It is also important that Since there should be uh, yeah. digital literacy in the rural areas, because, of course, the low cost of Internet across the India has uh, brought smartphones in every hands 
at, um, means at all strata of life. So uh, it, it should not be difficult to dig digitally literate those uh, uh, rural areas so that we can connect and bridge the gap between rural and urban centers so that uh, the health informations can be uh, can be communicated to all uh, all sectors of the uh, of life so that is also very important our digital health stack is quite quite robust uh, with ayushman bharat i think as you rightly said and also i think uh, uh, the second stack which is also very very developed is the ups stack uh, so I think we some we need something which is in the health sector also something like an UPI thing which which democratizes uh, accessibility to health health information. Uh, I think that would be very critical because uh, we I think isolated companies and even us can create websites, but to reach that website is very critical because Sir, be, be, technology people in has India been technology has been aptly used in all other fields except healthcare. Health, exactly. You see the media vans going in smallest of rural Indias and you know the, wherever the tunnel thing was happening, you had five uh, media vans covering the, uh, the tunnel digging all the time. You have Domino's providing you pizza in, in, in 30 minutes and you can't afford an ambulance reaching in 30 minutes. Yeah. So a technology has been utilized by every other. You have a robust network today, Aishwan Bharat and other. So we have to use that network for providing healthcare also. That's, exactly. that's my exactly. submission. That's Why true. are we not using technology uh, to optimize healthcare? True, sir. E to exactly to your point, sir. For example, we saw uh, on uh, the the OTT platforms the number of uh, people who see a cricket match is close to five crore pe people seeing that. Eighteen and crores for T20 yesterday. Exactly. So technically, and but within crores. within the entire entire uh, journey of the match, there is no single health ad at all. There is, uh, there'll be fin influencers, there'll be kind of media influencers, but be, there's no health influencer at all. So I think it's also an urge for our doctors in the community to kind of uh, up their ante on becoming med influencers for the social cause. There is no incentive to that, but I think there is, there is a lot of benefit uh, to their own practice. And uh, Dr. Mukesh is my colleague here. I can, I can just vouch for that, that going forward, this is going to be one of the most big things, uh, and we're investing deeply into that. I think, uh, I think that's critical for us to kind of ensure that uh, from, from our side, we pass see, on the right message uh, on see also how to invest what, in health. What is, what is, I think all of us will agree what has happened in the last three decades is, that all the uh, advancements have happened in the metro cities. You have great education institutions coming up in metro cities. You have great job opportunities coming in medical in the uh, metro cities. And you have got all the healthcare infrastructures being developed. So what has happened? That all the migration of populations happened to <laughs> Delhi, Bombay, Madras. And this is, Delhi is swarming with people because you know the, the child will get education, you get a job and it's good healthcare. I'll give you an example of a reverse migration which the government is now trying is. You know, about seven, eight years back, the government thought about doing an Rishikesh, starting an AIMS in Rishikesh. And, you know, I have been to Rishikesh before also. I was there at the inauguration of AIMS. I've gone there once or twice to give a lecture there also. Now, what has happened with Rishikesh now after seven years is, it's a different town altogether. People don't want to move out of Rishikesh. There are great education institutions coming up in Rishikesh. There is great tourism coming up in Rishikesh. There are malls coming up in Rishikesh. There are eateries coming up in Rishikesh. So everything is hovering around healthcare. So I think we will somehow have to shift healthcare to B cities, C cities, and have a reverse migration and equal distribution of resources and equal distribution of them. I think with this, we'll conclude this session and over to the organizers. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much to all our panelists. I would request you all to please uh, join us for the group photo. Yeah. We're going to have two questions. One will be uh, from ma'am. She was asking one question in the last session, which is due for this session. So I would request her to please continue with your question. OK. Please use the mic. Three questions. Can we please have the mic? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Jagdish Shivare, uh, professor and ex-scientist, ISRO. Sir, according to the medical literature, the female lungs are weaker and uh, 10 to 12% smaller in size 
compared to the male lungs. So my question, are the female lungs more cancer oriented by the air pollution, smoking and alcohol drinking? Very interesting question. I think it's... So there is no such data supporting this that female will be more it's about exposure, okay? Females are not vulnerable to lung cancer. They are more vulnerable to breast cancer. And, but for the lung cancer, there's nothing. But yes, you can see now more number of non-smoker female coming with you. You just go to the rural side. You see the practices, the way, and it's not, smoking is not about cigarette smoking. It's about any kind of, exp, you know, smoke you are exposed in your lifetime. Like they used to, you have coal and many of the other products to, to not BD, sir. You know, they are not smoker, but I have seen many in Ames Patna, they have published one data, more than 25% of the non-smoker female were exposed to smoke during the cooking time. So over the 20, 30 periods, because it's about uh, the content of the air pollutants, which has many of the content, which is group one, a group two, a carcinogens as per the IARC monogram classification. So how many, you know, the period you are exposed to those carcinogens, they make the carcinogenesis and cause lung cancer. So, and many of the times you are exposed to the dust, but they don't have, like AQI was raised to 1000, but they didn't have the component of AQI, which is, you know, so bad, uh, you know, uh, to the health in comparison to other where you have more number of carbon monoxide PM 2.5. Yes, Hello, sir, I am technology expert. Sir, I invented, you know, desert cooler sprinklers in 78. So the biggest problem is, you know, we don't have, you know, water. Water is the main, main you know, uh, thing, you know, which will absorb all the dust. The pollution is dust, simple dust, and, and we need water. In my desert cooler, you know, I am using and experimenting, you know, for the last, you know, since 76. You know, I uh, collect about five kg of mud, mud and dust. And you know, it, it is, you know, 10 times or 20 times more than what we are getting from uh, these, these, imported, uh, these imported flips and other, you know, purifiers, air purifiers. You know, they collect maybe 50 grams. Right. You know, this some, one just desert cooler collects Absolutely, five sir. kg of dust. So we all know that, sir. I and mean, you know, we, and we, we don't use sprinklers in our agriculture. It's it's a sad thing so that you know actually it is recommended you sprinkle, you put water on the roadside, plant more trees. Everybody knows that, but nothing is happening, sir. Please, sir, thank you. Sir. We will try and work it out. Yes, sir. Last question. Uh, sir, um, I have a question for Dr. Abhishek as well as uh, Dr. Mukesh, if they can answer me, sir. Uh, we are talking about the lung cancer, and in lung cancer, the uh, innovative medicine is called uh, mobocertinib. Uh, huh? Can you tell me, sir, what is the uh -huh, success uh -huh. rate of mobocertinib uh, in lung cancer, sir? What is? Success rate, sir. Mobocertinib. I have not used it. Sir, have you tried? Yeah. No. Mobisertinib uh, is a targeted drug uh, for the exon 20 insertion. So, in a stage 4 uh, adenocarcinoma of lung, in non smoker females or light smokers, we can get this mutation around less than 1% cases. So, this drug is approved for this indication. But now, recently, the, there are certain phases of trials. So, in phase 3 trial, this drug was withdrawn that it didn't get uh, that optimistic results that it's supposed to do. There is another drug with this exon 20 uh, insertion is amiventanam. It is a monoclonal antibody that is approved. So this drug has shown some promise in early trials. Now it is withdrawn. Well, it has negative uh, trials. Thank you. I think with this we will conclude this session. Uh, I would request Sandeep and Ritika and all other organizers from SOCHAM that whenever they come out with the bites for the media today, they must highlight the importance of environment and pollution in causing lung cancer. Today's uh, press release must concentrate and highlight in bold that we are all concerned about the incidence of rising lung cancer because of environment. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us for this session.
I would request everyone to please be seated as we are moving towards the third session of the day. Lung Cancer Treatment, Innovation Financing and Enhancing Health Benefit Package. As we are discussing a lot about cancer and the treatment, now we are moving towards how finance and monetary terms going to help us out or the kind of policies we have in order to you know, get the treatment and things like this. I would request Dr. Sunil K. Khetrapal, Director, AHPI, to please join us on the dais. I would request Dr. Sant Ram, Director Medical, Employee State Insurance Corporation, Ministry of Labor and Employment, Government of India, to please join us on dais. I would request Dr. Shelja Saxena, Chief Medical Officer in Charge Family Welfare, CGHS HQ, Ministry of Health and Family Health Welfare, Government of India, to please join us on the dais. I would request Dr. Abhitab Gupta, Chief Business Executive, Ace, Ace Insurance Brokers Private Limited, to please join us on the dais. I would request Dr. Shikha Sharma, Consultant, National Health Authority, Government of India, to please join us on the dais. I would request Dr. Mokil Choksi, Deputy Country Director, Technical, Access Health International, to please join us on the dais. I would request Mr. Vivek Sharma, Founder Director, UHAPO Patient Advocacy Group, to please join us, Dais. I would also request Dr. Rohit Ramchandra, Director Marketing, Oncology, MSD Pharmaceutical Private Limited, to please join us on the Dais for third session as well. I would like to present a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I would request Dr. Sunil K. Khetrapal to please present his welcome address. Can I please have a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, SOHM, for the opportunity. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to this uh, very pivotal uh, session, which is focused on matter of utmost importance, healthcare. I mean, the. Uh, financing part of the lung cancer, you know, the costing part of the lung cancer, which is, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, representatives, we have panelists from representing different uh, uh, domain of, you know, uh, healthcare, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Shikha Sharma, who is a consultant, an HA, and then uh, we have uh, Dr. Shailaja Saxena, Chief Medical Officer in Charge Family Welfare, CGHS Headquarter, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, we have Dr. Abhitab Gupta. He is the Chief Business Executive, AS Insurance Brokers Private Limited. And uh, Dr. Malik Choksi, uh, sitting next to Dr. Shailaja, is a, a, a Deputy Country Director Technical, Access Health International. And we have uh, Mr. Vivek Sharma, who is the Founder and Director of UHAPO, and which, which is a patient advocacy group. So just, we are, none of us are oncologists. None of us are oncologists. None of us are cancer specialists. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, the, you know, the topic of discussion is something. And uh, we all know that lung cancer is a global you know, uh, health burden, and it is a leading cause of death in India, uh, which is 25% uh, uh, for all cancer deaths among men and 10% uh, among all cancer deaths among women. So in the incidence of lung cancer, we all know that uh, you know, it is, uh, you can say, 7 per lakh or 70, around 70,000 per year uh, new cases detected every year. And the incidence has been increasing over the, the past few years. So another thing is that, you know, the tuberculosis also is, uh, uh, is a major disease burden. We all know that. And 20% uh, of the cases, uh, lung cancer cases, they have coexisting 
tuberculosis as a coexisting disease. So you can imagine how complex is the treatment. So it is not only the medical treatment part. The financial part, the, treat, the cost of treatment also is, has an impact. You know, when it is associated with other comorbidities, lung cancer is associated with other comorbidities, or tuberculosis as per se, which is also a, a lung tuberculosis. So, and it is a major public health concern. But thing is, what is more important here is that early detection through screening is, is very, very important, right? And uh, of lack of awareness, we are not aware. And especially, I'm not going to the technical part, the causes, you all know smoke. Smoking is the major cause, air pollutants, toxins. These are all the causes of lung uh, cancer. And not only smokers get lung cancer, majority of the smokers, they get lung cancer, but lung cancers are seen also in non-smokers. Non so, it's a very complex situation. And treatment of lung cancer, if we talk about the treatment, that, uh, you know, the following modalities are there. We have surgery, we have radiotherapy, we have chemotherapy, we have targeted therapy, we have immunotherapy. And, uh, you know, and most important part is when with the, with the newer, uh, uh, you know, more, more these modalities of treatment, the targeted therapy, chemotherapy, the cost also escalates. I think th what we have to, you know, uh, uh, discuss today is the various types uh, of, uh, you know, uh, costing. I mean, how, pay, how the consumer, how the patient spends for the treatment of lung cancer. It is either out of pocket or he has, is covered under uh, private health insurance or he is uh, covered under Aishman Bharat or some state or central government health scheme, CGHS, or state, and or there may be some, you know, a patient may be getting some financial aid from some advocacy group or some uh, NGOs and any, any other organizations. So this is how, you know, the, the cost of treatment is managed in our country. And Ayushman Bharat, of course, uh, you know, it covers almost all the, uh, pa the packages. They cover lung cancer is also part of, of course, the cancer treatment, so it covers all aspects, even, even CGHS, I think, also covers uh, the cost of all the cancers, including lung cancer. So this co topic is very critical. So just to uh, start with, the, with this session, uh, we have, I'm sorry, I did not introduce Rohit, actually, uh, Dr. Rohit Ramchandra, uh, Dr. Rohit Ramchandra Gatule. He is the Director of Marketing Oncology and MSD Pharmaceutical Private Limited sitting next to me. Uh, we will uh, have a, uh, you know, uh, discussion with the, uh, you know, very engaging discussion I would like to have with all the panelists. But before that, we will start with a presentation by uh, Rohit. If, uh, Dr. Rohit, if you can give your presentation in five minutes. Yeah, right? Thank you. Okay, uh, so good afternoon again. Thanks, uh, Tongs, thanks Dr. Chetripal for, for the opportunity and also Asucham for the opportunity. Uh, what he's gonna kind of discuss now is uh, about uh, very pertinent topic about uh, lung cancer and plus uh, kind of what are the health implications of a long-term uh, uh, kind of projections to cancers in India. And it's gonna be very essential for, for the panelists to also discuss about uh, these points because I think this will lead to a lot of conversations uh, in the panel itself. Uh, so what you'll see here is I think uh, MSD led this project with a third party prog uh, kind of a, uh, a program owner. Uh, basic idea behind this uh, research was uh, mainly kind of to identify what are the health implications with exposure to immuno-oncology products over a long term period of time. Second, what's the societal value? of addition of these compounds to, uh, to our health packages or even access to these products. And, and last but not the least, and, uh, what should the regulators look at on timely reimbursement of these molecules? And what will lead to, uh, uh, kind of, is it a positive impact, is it a negative impact, we'll see potentially through, through this health impact uh, projections. Uh, 
so how was the research conducted? I think maybe just quick summary. Obviously, any research has kind of some databases which are clinical in nature and, and other majorly from an economic perspective. Uh, there are costs which are administrative costs, uh, kind of costs associated to the acquisition of the drugs, uh, costs associated to the kind of uh, patient being kind of uh, administered administer drug at a local site, uh, traveling and associated other factors, plus the epidemiology of the cancer over the uh, five, to, uh, five to 10 years of time. And these are the various factors which were considered uh, in health impact projection. And, and obviously, uh, uh, from an economic standpoint, I think these are the major kind of costs which are associated. Uh, we all know there are indirect and direct costs associated to that. And what, how do we define a health impact projection is basically through, through major terms of uh, the positive impact, whether life years are gained, colleagues are gained, uh, and what benefit it does uh, to, to the overall kind of uh, benefit to the societal costs. Uh, we'll look at uh, kind of quickly how this uh, kind of it was run specifically for a couple of indications in the country uh, and you'll see a lot of immuno oncology compounds written here starting from nivolumab, atezolizumab, pembrolizumab. These are complex names to kind of various pro immunological molecules which are available for treatment of various cancers. Uh, there were nine basic indications which were considered for uh, research and uh, projection, and I think very interesting uh, to hear from now for, for everyone. Uh, the indications were uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which is the topic of today's uh, and the Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, then head and neck cancers, cervical cancer, esophageal cancer, uh, triple negative breast cancer, which is again uh, not the very commonest type of cancer in the country, but one of the most difficult to treat uh, breast cancer type. And the last but not least is RCC, which is the kidney cancer types. And across these uh, various indications, uh, which are six different tumor types, uh, these uh, newer therapies were compared versus uh, the cost associated with them versus the existing standard of care uh, over a five years time frame. And uh, how it was done, obviously uh, the global data it comes from a central repository uh, which is kind of available epidemiological researches and uh, the other data stacks was kind of, kind of evaluated and in fact uh, gathered through a market research uh, basically by kind of uh, uh, detailed interviews with kind of top oncologists in the country. Uh, and I think uh, that that led to a lot of kind of understanding and how it will impact uh, uh, kind of uh, patients from a, from a standpoint of efficacy and uh, kind of clinical benefits. Uh, quickly kind of summarizing in uh, maybe I think very interesting topic here to kind of see and these are staggering numbers and you'll see that in over the next five year period of time from 2023 to 27, uh, India will be treating close to 4 million patients which are just cancer patients. Four million, meaning 45 lakh patients will be treated in the country. Uh, and if everything goes right, one third of these patients will be exposed to some kind of immunotherapy, which are anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 therapies. Meaning that a substantial chunk of our resources, you and mine, are gonna go into procuring such compounds. What is going to be happening because of these is uh, there's an absolute change. Uh, because of uh, the advancement in therapy, there is a positive gain in the overall life years gain. And you'll see uh, close to overall, uh, among 1.4 uh, million patients, close to 9 lakh years of life is going to be gained over a period of time, which is 26% above uh, the existing therapies and standard of care. Uh, 7 lakh quality, quality, quality life years are going to be gained. And obviously, there's, again, positive benefit to PFS, and AIDS. Again, these are very complex terms, but all in all, there is a very positive impact to the health stack if we are able to kind of uh, expose the patients over a period of time to uh, immunotherapies. Uh, again, this is uh, kind of uh, uh, health stack showing from 23 to 27. Obviously, there is a huge investment of 1.6 trillion uh, uh, rupees to kind of uh, over f five years of time. Uh, but what's going to happen because of that is uh, shows here. Uh, the disease management cost is going to be, be going to be upping because of the in investments in the uh, in, in the immunotherapy because the patient is going to live longer. It also means that because of the uh, long term survival of the patients, there's going to be increased admin cost uh, of uh, the FTs involved or the kind of uh, HCPs involved in uh, de delivering the care. And second, drug acquisition cost is going to be the second largest kind of economic burden. But the positive side to that is going to be that there is a decreasing AE cost decreased wastage cost, and the total implication to the health stack is going to be 1.6 trillion, but what you will see is that over a period of time, we gain 5.9 trillion rupees in, in benefit because of the exposure to immunotherapies. What all it means, that just to summarize, uh, it's very complex to kind of understand uh, in, a, in five minute setting, but uh, overall, we're gonna kind of benefit close to 45 million, uh, 4.5 million patients 
uh, out of which 1.4 million will be exposed to immunotherapy. What is going to happen because of that is basically uh, we're going to increase the colleagues by close to nine years of colleagues total of, of these patients exposed. We're going to reduce the AEs by two lakh patients, number of AEs is going to be reduced. Secondly, uh, we're going to also increase uh, the uh, addressable population which can going to be exposed to, uh, to lung cancer treatment. And I think uh, one of the most beneficial, beneficial factors here is going to be the uh, decrease in the cost of end-of-life care costs, which are associated to currently because of uh, the high amount of kind of uh, mortality burden associated with lung cancer. I think with this, uh, I'll just stop here and kind of pass it on to the panel discussion for more discussion. I think this, this kind of is a great segue to kind of discuss that how does uh, the health implications and kind of finally the financial decisions are taken uh, by the various experts here. So thank you. will be treated uh, in next five years. This is about total cancers you are talking about, not only lung cancer, of course. So uh, very nicely elucidated. I think, uh, thank you, Rohit. Now I would st uh, like to start uh, uh, the panel discussion. And my first question, I'll start from my extreme, my left, uh, Mr. Vivek. Uh, Mr. Vivek, uh, you know, it's very, you know, the role of public-private partnership is very, very important when we talk of developing the innovative financing solution. So what role can public-private partnership play in developing the innovative financing solutions for the lung cancer, for the lung cancer? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I end up, like before I uh, get into the kind of uh, answer or uh, the suggestion or, you know, uh, other things, uh, let me tell you that this is one country that we live in. when when the government doesn't work for any reason, this country's people have done their work equally. And when we talk about public-private partnership, we have various models which are existing in our country. Like, if we take the example of ESIC, how does ESIC work? Like, uh, there are uh, medium and small-scale uh, uh, organizations, they uh, contribute to the insurance of uh, the people who are working with them, and uh, equal uh, you know, uh, amount is contributed from the government, and then that's how they are insured. So we have machineries uh, mechanism available in our society, but yes, uh, going forward, probably they are not enough or they have not been optimized. Probably we need to look at the awareness uh, level at those uh, interventions and make people aware because they, one hand, there's a population who is already insured and they are not aware about their benefits. We need to kind of make them aware and optimize the existing policy. On the other hand, uh, when we talk about uh, the lung cancer, because it's an expensive disease, as Dr. Saab also said about, uh, you know, uh, involvement of immunotherapy and other things, these are expensive things. None of us, uh, you know, like uh, probably, uh, barring few of us, uh, most of us cannot afford, in, God forbid, if we have to go through lung cancer, we can't even afford the treatment. At that point of time, even government cannot uh, absorb everything. And even if it does, like, Madam is here from CGHS, she would know that uh, the benefits and the, uh, the everything has got some kind of ceiling. So probably uh, in terms of PPP model, if we have to say that we probably we need to create some kind of pool of funds that enable people financially to take care of the treatment. It may be like, uh, if, you, if you remember before GST, there used to be a Krishi Kalyan says, I, I know that uh, many of the entrepreneurs and businessmen would not agree with me, but uh, maybe, you know, we can collect some kind of, maybe even if it is, you know, 100 rupees or 1,000 rupees a year from the enterprises or anybody who is making money, that contribution can be pulled up and one financial pool can be, you know, made. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, the awareness and uh, optimization of the current resources is uh, one key aspect that I believe others can contribute. Great. I think the role of public-private partnership is very, very important. And uh, my next question is to uh, Dr. Malik. Dr. Malik, you know, mostly we talk about the treatment cost and, uh, you know, everybody is talking of treatment of lung cancer. The cost is too much. Average uh, lung cancer patient spends about four to seven lakhs for his, his or her treatment. This is the average figure which, uh, you know, we have, the study has shown. But uh, nobody talks about the preventive part of the lung cancer. So, uh, how can the health system effectively integrate the preventive measures? I mean, uh, 
preventive measures with the com comprehensive lung uh, packages for the treatment, uh, in, which includes both preventive and treatment part. I mean, we, how, how, how do you, uh, you know, what is your opinion on that sir. preventive part? Thanks for the question. I think so let me start uh, by acknowledging firstly that no health system globally can provide each and every treatment free of cost, right? It's not possible. And when we start with that argument, I think so, we need to manage our healthcare systems in available resources. In economics, we say a budget constraint line. We need to operate under budget constraint line. And in budget constraint line, then you will go for provision of those technologies, commodities, or therapy which are most cost effective. Uh, what Rohit did mention about uh, a short term effect versus long term benefit. We need to assess those kind of uh, permutation combination. Now, when I start looking at health system as a whole, care is always expensive than prevention, yes. right? And henceforth, when you say we talk about lung cancer, so there are, if, if I look at you know, genetics, exposure, occupational health, now climate change, like daily is climate change example, four points which are direct attributing to development of lung cancer. So if we start investing in those, I think so the burden of disease overall goes down, which is expensive, and that's what you said, right? But having said that, for us to, to migrate from there to there, again, you know, uh, 6,000, uh, 6, 6 lakh, 7 lakh numbers that we quoted, in lung cancer, they are those cases which are kind of coming in kind of pretty late stages of, of their cancer progression, third stage or fourth uh, stage of cancer progression. So now, again, it goes back to health system strengthening, where we need early diagnosis of those people. So they are caught early so that they don't reach to third or fourth stage of cancer treatment, which is expensive in nature. And for early diagnosis and for, for those treatment, cost-effective treatment to enter into a market, we need a regulatory ecosystem. Average time taken for innovative diagnostic or treatment penetrating in low and middle income country is 12 to 14 years. It goes as high as 16 years. So your active patent life goes down from, four, uh, from 20 years, uh, uh, it, it is around four years to six years. It's, it's not viable for, for uh, high innovative products to kind of otherwise enter market. So I think so, when we talk about systems perspective, you need those regulatory changes for that there is a faster penetration of product. You need to invest in kind of uh, 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 preventive measures, which is climate change, uh, uh, kind of indoor pollution kind of stuff. You need to have early diagnosis so that whatever uh, cases come to you, detect earlier. And then comes what Rohit did mention about having those therapy which has better kind of long-term outcome. On a shorter run, they may be expensive, but when you talk about the survival period and adverse reaction, they might be cost effective. And I think so where, again, NHA is working on it, but we need to build systems capacity to do those kind of health technology assessment for kind of faster penetration of innovative products. So this is, I think so we need this, this comprehensive approach to deal with this complex situation. Uh, I think very important, the key message here is uh, the early detection. Because, you know, the, the earlier you detect the disease, the, the earlier you treat the disease, you, uh, of course, uh, it, you know, outcome is better, of course. And you can reduce the morbidity and mortality from lung cancer. I think it is the key. And uh, my next question is to Dr. Shailaja. Dr. Shailaja, you are uh, in Nirman Bhavan, you know, you are the Ministry of Health uh, and Family Welfare. And uh, according to you, how can we expand the scope of health benefit packages to include comprehensive coverage for the lung cancer treatment? थैंक यू फॉर द क्वेश्चन पर सबसे पहले मैं आप सभी लोगों को ये बताना चाहूँगी कि ये नवंबर का महीना चल रहा है कैंसर अवेयरनेस का और एसोचेम को बहुत बहुत बधाई कि उन्होंने इस नवंबर के मंथ में ये कैंसर अवेयरनेस का लंग कैंसर पे ये टॉपिक रखा तो जहाँ तक सीजीएचएस की बात है सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट हेल्थ स्कीम शुरुआत में इसमें काफ़ी कम जगह पर यह सी जी की शुरुआत हुई थी 25 सिटीज से हुई थी जो अब एक्सपैंड करके हम लोगों ने 80 सिटीज में इसको शुरुआत कर दी है और 340 जो वेलनेस सेंटर है एलोपैथी के वो यहाँ पर स्टार्ट हुए हैं पूरे कंट्री में तो जो हमारा हेल्थ का जो स्कोप है धीरे धीरे हम सेंटर्स भी बढ़ा रहे हैं उसमें सुविधाएं भी बढ़ रही हैं तो कंसल्टेशन से शुरू होता है हेल्थ एंड वेलनेस सेंटर जो है हमारा वहाँ से कंसल्टेशन शुरू होता है रेफरल हम लोगों ने काफ़ी बढ़ा दिए हैं और जितने भी प्राइवेट हॉस्पिटल्स हैं 
प्राइव उससे सी जी एच एस का करार हुआ है और जहाँ पर हम लोगों ने सी जी एच एस एम्पेनल्ड हॉस्पिटल है उनकी संख्या भी अराउंड टू थाउजेंड कर दी है टाटा मेमोरियल जहाँ तक कैंसर की बात है तो टाटा मेमोरियल हॉस्पिटल जो है बॉम्बे का उससे हमारे कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट के लिए हम लोगों ने एक मेमोरेंडम ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग साइन की है जो हमारे सी जी एच एस के बेनिफिशरीज़ हैं वहाँ जाके फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट अपना ट्रीटमेंट करवा सकते हैं फॉर पेंशनर कैशलेस होगा और जितने भी सर्विंग एम्प्लॉयज़ हैं उनका उनका डिपार्टमेंट उसको रीएम्बर्स करेगा और जितने एम्स हैं उनसे भी सी जी एच एस ने अपना सारे ट्रीटमेंट के लिए और इस्पेली कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट के लिए मेमोरेंडम ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग रिसेंटली साइन किया है तो एम्स में भी ट्रीटमेंट जो होगा फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट होगा सबका तो इस तरह सी जी एच एस अपनी सेवाओं का विस्तार कर रहा है और हम लोगों ने आई टी में भी जो नेशनल हेल्थ अथॉरिटी है वहाँ से भी हमारे जो बिलिंग और ये सब होते हैं उसको फास्ट करने के लिए आई टी इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर को भी उनके साथ करार किया हुआ है सी जी एच एस में जो मेडिसिन है वो आप सब लोग जानते ही हैं कि फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट मिलती है और कैंसर की भी जितनी भी मेडिसिन है हमारे मेडिकल स्टोर्स से मिलती है या इंडेंट होकर मिलती है और हॉस्पिटल जितने भी एम्पेनल्ड हॉस्पिटल हैं वहाँ पर भी जो ट्रीटमेंट होता है वो कैंशन पेंशनर्स के लिए तो कैशलेस है और सर्विंग एम्प्लॉयज़ को उनका डिपार्टमेंट रीएम्बर्स करता है तो इस तरह सी जी एच एस अपनी सेवाओं का विस्तार कर रहा है करीब फोर्टी टू लैक्स हमारे सर्विंग और पेंशनर्स बेनिफिशरीज़ हैं जिनको कि हम लोग सी जी एच एस के अंदर सारी सेवाएं देते हैं मैं चूँकि हेड क्वार्टर में हिंदी भी सब्जेक्ट एक देख रही हूँ इसलिए मैं अपने हिंदी में ही आप लोगों से बात कर रही हूँ तो डुअल पर्पस सॉल्व हो रहा है हिंदी का प्रमोशन भी एंड प्लस आपसे इस बारे में बात करके भी नहीं नहीं थैंक यू डॉक्टर शैलजा आपने बहुत अच्छी तरह से बताया कि द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट इज़ आल्सो यू नो डूइंग इट्स बिट डूइंग अ लॉट ऑफ गुड वर्क एज फार एज द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ लंग कैंसर इज कंसर्न एंड ह्यूज चंक ऑफ बेनिफिशरीज फोर्टी टू लैख फोर्टी टू लैक्स नॉट और काफ़ी होता है फोर पॉइंट टू मिलियन द सर्विंग एन द रिटायरी Uh, and uh, everything is free you know and post uh, this matlab discharge also from you yeah. get some uh, yeah. 15 days discharge days? ke baad bhi jitni bhi medicines vagera hoti hai sari free of uh, free hoti hai sari okay, free hoti hai kitne din ki dete hain aap kiraye aapne वो तो सर वन मंथ की होती है पर उसके बाद भी कंसल्टेशन की मैक्सिमम ठीक है हां जो भी स्पेशलिस्ट लिखते हैं वो सब आगे भी मेडिसिंस जारी रहती है सारी नाउ माय नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज टू डॉक्टर शिखा शर्मा डॉक्टर शिखा uh i would just like to you know ask you about the challenges financial challenges what are the financial challenges faced by the patients and their families in india for the for treatment of lung cancer uh thank you so much sir for the question uh first of all i would like to uh, speak about what pmjy has taken the initiative towards uh, oncology treatments so currently uh, in health benefit packages of pmjy we are covering around 266 packages under medical oncology then radiation oncology we uh, have approx 46 packages and 238 packages under uh, surgical oncology where we also have a palliative medicine care also as far as sir you have asked about the financial uh, challenges so uh, i mean uh, as pmjy has taken the initiative with uh, government of india uh, we have uh, i mean you know targeting 50% of the population uh, to cover uh, to give a treatment under oncology but still i think uh, middle class families are still left out uh, missing middle we call yes, it missing middle <laughs> missing middle yeah yes uh. so many of the state uh, go- i mean government they uh, you know they oh, morely uh, taking care of inpatient treatments okay. but uh, as far as we are concerned about the screening pre confirming investigations are still not covered so i think uh, screening uh, is a very important to uh, you know provide a treatment towards the on call i mean cancer treatment so still i think we should work on uh, you know screening and pre uh, conf- confirmation of the investigations so i think these so, are the things yeah, which so is it's like, not comprehensive actually yes. if you see it's only the treatment so when we talk about comprehensive it should be like you know opd consultations absolutely screening and uh, pre confirming investigation that are still i think i think it's evolving maybe in future we hope that probably uh, sir i mean <laughs> <laughs> yes 
So, so anyway, yeah. uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Shikha. And uh, my next question would be to Dr. Abhitab Gupta. Dr. Abhitab Gupta basically is a radiologist, but he has diversified into this insurance business. And uh, you know, I would just like uh, to ask you a very pertinent question, which is related to your specialty, of course, health insurance. So can you explain the overall scenario of uh, uh, the health insurance coverage in India? I mean, with, uh, with reference to today's topic. Uh, absolutely. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, sure. So in India, typically, if we look at uh, entire healthcare expenditure, 65% of the uh, healthcare expenditure is out of pocket. And 35% is the segment which uh, the insurance uh, industry targets, basically. And insurance uh, uh, premiums today form about 37% of the entire insurance portfolio in India. So when we had started this industry, it was less than 4%. And in these 20 years, look at where it has gone. And I'm sure it will uh, easily cross 50%, uh, which means health insurance is basically or would be a driver for uh, the entire insurance sector, uh, you know, in the years to come. So when, when we started, uh, we came across this product called MediClaim. Now, MediClaim is uh, a very restricted product, and it addresses only sickness uh, part of it. It's not a holistic, uh, uh, you know, coverage. It says only if you are admitted for minimum 24 hours. Now there have been some amendments to it, of course. But it says we will not cover you otherwise for anything else. So today, some in of the insurance companies are, of course, trying to come out uh, with newer insurance products, but the traditional mindset still remains that it will, uh, or it still is currently, uh, is a hospitalization-based product. It doesn't really address the other aspects of healthcare as of now. Uh, if I have to look at uh, product segmentation and if I have to talk about lung cancer in particular, see, we have retail products, which is basically for the individuals. And there, there is a restriction of uh, pre-existing disease coverages. So if somebody has a lung cancer and somebody wants to go in for an insurance uh, product, of course, they'll not be able to even uh, get themselves covered under health insurance, beat any product. Then the second category of product is uh, uh, the group products. So various corporates have uh, very different tailor-made kind of insurances where they are able to cover pre-existing diseases for themselves, for their families, and sometimes even for their parents. Now, that is where uh, the coverage uh, under a group scheme, I think, uh, is one of the best if I have to relate it to only insurance. Uh, but uh, in retail product, if somebody already has it, it will never get covered. And then we have these mass schemes, of course, uh, Dr. Shikha is here, where it gets covered uh, in one way or the other, which also includes some pre and post, and they have various packages attached to the whole thing. So. If I have to uh, conclude this particular question, yes. Uh, lung cancer is covered under health insurance, provided it's not pre-existing under one or two products. And uh, it also gets covered uh, from the therapies uh, perspective. So, which means basically chemotherapy and radiotherapy are also covered. And uh, new age therapies, which we uh, talked about, of course, the immunotherapy and, uh, you know, targeted, targeted, therapy. targeted therapies. Mm. They're also covered. Uh, they are covered, to, but targeted to a very limited covered, extent. Only some products yeah. cover it. I think that is where the industry dialogue is actually required between all stakeholders. Insurance companies just needs proof as to what, you know, Rohit was giving us as to how beneficial it's going to be. because. The medical sciences keep advancing, and the insurance companies 
uh, are not sure whether this is an experimental treatment or a treatment which actually uh, is necessitated. So I think a dialogue in that uh, perspective would be a yeah, I think slowly, I think uh, uh, the insurance companies would uh, start realizing the importance of this targeted therapy. I remember when robotic therapy came into market, I mean, when it started, none of the insurance companies were reimbursing the robotic uh, surgeries, robotic surgery. But uh, later on, I think uh, some of the insurance companies have started. Yeah, sir. So, so I think same way this targeted therapy is so important. I mean, absolutely. And uh, it's a newer technology, of course. Absolutely. Uh, I think slowly the IRDAI, they should also, like insurance companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as we move forward, I'll let you know <laughs> as to what uh, needs so to be So let's done. hope yeah. for the best. Uh, thank you. Uh, my, again, uh, my uh, second question to Dr. Vivek. Uh, uh, Mr. Vivek, yeah. You are doing a lot of good work in patient advocacy. So what patient advocacy measures uh, can be taken to influence the, these financial models, uh, you know, to make it more patient-centric? Sir, first of all, I think that patient advocacy will be advocacy to patient advocacy. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Good. Because Good uh, the awareness level and the implication of patient Absolutely. advocacy is, is very deep. Uh, and if I have to... I'm a middle class boy. Uh, I'm born in a joint fam uh, brought up in a joint family. If I have to take it uh, as an example, like, uh, my mother used to cook uh, very good uh, food, delicious food. I mean, she was very hard work in the evening. और जब शाम को खाने सबकी माँ है अच्छा खाना बनाती है आप किसी से भी पूछ लीजिए ट्विस्ट अब आएगा सर सॉरी सो शाम को जब घर पहुँचते लोग एंड आधे से ज़्यादा लोग नाराज़ हो जाते हैं उस खाने पे क्यों आज कद्दू की सब्जी बनी है ओह माय गॉड आई डोंट लाइक इट नाउ माँ का मूड भी खराब द सेम थिंग हैपन्स इन दी पॉलिसी मेकिंग ऑल्सो इफ इफ वी इंक्लूड पॉलिसी आई मीन पेशेंट एडवोकेसी ग्रुप्स not only one or two or three, you know, like in, in variety, probably uh, uh, geographically, uh, you know, different groups and uh, in other sense also. So that gives us a need. I will tell you a very good example with you. Like we are talking about lung cancer. There is one big body who recommended government that uh, 2.5 lakhs, jo hai, this should be the minimum package which should be reimbursed. And then that's how, you know, we'll be able to access more number of people, number of patients. But in that package, they gave a lot of priority to the chemotherapy. In lung cancer, many of us know like Jeffertinib and other things, you know, they are targeted therapy. No, the, uh, beyond that also, I, I would not name anything. The targeted therapy, certain, those who were very critical, they were not included in that. So, pehli cheez to, humare desh mein lung cancer detect hi bahut late hota hai. Us mein bhi agar hum chemotherapy ke liye budget rakhte hai aur targeted therapy ko include hi nahi karte hai. That is not uh, probably the right set of, uh, you know, uh, the setting up things. And the second thing is that uh, I have a lot of friends uh, over the period of time who are practicing oncology and in various uh, uh, places of country, they say that, Vivek, the challenge is that uh, there are certain set of guidelines that uh, if patient comes to you, you have to do this, you, this will be reimbursed in this amount of time, you have to do this, you have to do this. But the thing is that, Somewhere, some person comes, because there are no clear guidelines. Somebody comes that, uh, and it becomes a divar picture ka scene. Jao pehle us ka sign leke aao. And now, they feel very discouraged that, abhi hum isko implement kaise kare. So, one is making the policy, and the other thing is implementation of the policy. So, probably, mera take is uh, a question ke liye ye rahega ki, uh, we need to include more and more uh, patient advocacy groups and understand their actual problems, not only patients, even the treating clinicians. We need to understand their challenges and then, uh, you know, kind of design and implement certain things. Uh, very important. Advocacy, the role of, uh, I mean, the, the healthcare providers' role is very important in patient advocacy and other groups. And I'll like, again ask you one more question uh, regarding this uh, case studies or any success stories if you would like to share with us you know, to improve access to uh, lung cancer care through this uh, financial, uh, I mean, right. uh, innovations, any financial innovations. Yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, Ma'am has already mentioned that uh, it's uh, Lung Cancer Awareness Month, and now you can see that our conference is the second lung cancer conference. Hai. Lung cancer is not a new thing, it's not a new thing, right? Because lung cancer, there was a lot of work in the first place. So, you can see how many things you can see on Google, how many things you can see on cervical cancer, how many things you can see because the prognosis is good there. Lung cancer ka prognosis was not to be uh, very good, uh, you know, few years back. 
it's because of the advancement of the technology and uh, you know advent of medical science people have started living more and that's when that gave the hope and we started uh, becoming more aware that gave us the hope to uh, do things so one group uh, i'll be very precise like i'm part of uh, an ecosystem uh, wherein we run a support group for cancer patients lung cancer patients okay. we do uh, monthly meeting we uh, bring in uh, one uh, you know uh, uh, one problem solver for their uh, issues other than the medications okay. because that itself is a very big issue in fact uh, we invite oncologists and treating physicians also at times and this is how you know we have been able to survive for four years and we have been able to connect more than 4000 lung cancer patients i'm talking about cancer and lung cancer 4000 cancer patients have been benefited with this thing so bahut kuch ho sakta hai is desh mein so there are examples and there would be many examples lot lot of people would be probably working we are not aware about it so the more uh, dialogue we have uh, the more things will come up uh, and uh, you know if i have to share with my experience yes Uh, support group model is one thing that uh, addresses patients need at various level and it helps them uh, beyond treatment which is very much required all of us sitting here uh, would agree that uh, it's not just the medication of course medication is very much important but uh, there are other uh, you know psychological issues uh, social psychological uh, factors financial well being they improve the quality of life and the longevity or the prognosis of the disease okay and dr molik would you like to share uh you know any any uh, uh, success stories or any studies so, uh, when you talk about patient advocacy group i have got a pros and cons right okay. patient advocacy group very very important uh, in terms of policy formulation i'll give an example 2006 in the developed world uh, breast cancer therapy at that time uh, the cost per qualies reimbursed was around uh, 40000 uh, pounds per qualies so you know the country now mm. uh, uh, uh that was the reimbursement benchmark by uh, nice international mm. the breast cancer drug at that time uh, after a health technology assessment was around 85000 pounds per qualies uh, obviously a health system is going to be pressured under budget constraint to reimburse that uh, pounds per qualies uh, 10 uh, downing street was uh, a kind of cordoned by advocacy group uh, there was no movement in and out of uh, 10 downing street eventually uh, at that time prime minister made sure that uh, 85000 pounds per qualies get reimbursed uh, that's that's the power of patient advocacy group but having said that now so let's say uh, when you have got huge budget constraint and we have got uh, uh, not enough money and you need to prioritize a versus b right, right. so which is 85000 pounds per qualies versus 40000 pounds per qualies at at an economist at an assistance perspective i think so i would like to reach benefit i would like the benefit to reach more and more people and that's that's an ethical dilemma that a health system uh, guys would face uh, they would like to give everything to everyone but under budget constraint is not possible and at that time again the pain point comes to that what is the evidence that we have now if i say 85000 pounds per qualies might work in a high income group 85000 pounds per qualies uh, the expenditure for a low income group which has got co morbidity might not be 85000 per qualies it might be 105000 per qualies and at that time something comes as risk adjustment formulas which helps in uh, age uh, geography uh, uh, co morbidity and i think so at india level and and i think so we were we are discussing so we need uh, when nha is kind of uh, looking at benefit package designing we need to evolve this risk adjustment formulas patient advoc advocacy group becomes very very important uh, in terms of Uh, when we talk about uh, support structures and, and and kind of palliative care post treatment come very very important but again double edged sword yeah. 85000 pounds per qualies what was i i know that year mm -hmm. lot of other treatment were stopped because the budget was approved and you know, the budget gets approved uh, in, in in kind of march and in mid term you kind of uh, enter something with 85000 pole it's going to suck away money from somewhere else so i think so good evidence is required advocacy advocacy group at times needs to be a bit more kind of a bit more pragmatic that you know even if government wants to kind of make everything uh, affordable and accessible is not possible and at that time it's a kind of chicken and egg and it's a very difficult situation what a policy makers and a program managers kind of have to deal with and it's and it's what i, I say it first level it's a complex situation uh, with this uh, complexity it's it's not difficult to uh, it's not easy to kind of manage difficulty great great thank you uh, yeah yeah i think uh, please dr shikha if you would like to add something as, as Yeah. Sir has suggested that uh, due to budgetary uh, constraints, we only include the packages which are which are cost effectiveness. 
so evidence and uh, you know efficiency is very very less even the hta when we see the uh, you know cost effectiveness the data is very very less so it is very difficult for us to prioritize the packages like you know okay so and, and sir if i may add and hence for the provider network the pharmaceutical industry mm. and patient advocacy group need to come together to, to provide yes. this evidence absolutely if, if if a company alone comes it's not acceptable because it's, it's perceived as profit orienting if a provider comes it comes look at he has got a preference for certain product or he's got an influence so until us all the system provider peer and advocacy group come together and generate evidence i think so we will keep on having this debate year after year but uh, absolutely jab tak sab ek sath nahi aayenge ek hi platform pe nahi aayenge so we need a point. collaborative just approach yeah sure rohit yeah just wanted to add a point sir uh, i think uh, very good discussion what dr malik and dr shailaja is mentioning and also as a as a pharma what also happens is that uh, there's a lot of impetus on data generation on scientific terms okay mm -hmm. and when we go with an health economic study nobody gives any bothers to that study what happens is that health becomes a state subject when the state wants health becomes a central subject when the center wants so pharma is in a flux or even providers are in the flux that where do we actually go where which doors we should we knock right i think we had pretty good success at some of the state levels but i think there has to be come unified language of conversation like the nih where uh, technically when we go with an evidence of of uh, showcasing efficacy and effectiveness together there there can be some merit kind of to viewed in that angle otherwise what happen is there'll be one uh, 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 kind of uh, telecast of amir khan's uh, kind of uh, show and then every impetus will be on generic uh, generic products and then potentially what deviates the conversation is that uh, it's innovation which has saved the world not uh, not uh, kind of living in the historical perspective right culture is equally important but innovation is at the same time very effective and important for very kind of true. saving the lives when we kind of really <laughs> matter the most uh, uh, i i need to add one thing but in one, one of the recent debate of, of getting this uh, 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 package design i think so none of the people right neither uh, research community neither uh, the producers neither companies provided evidence on the model on which the outcomes are estimated so until the models are not transparently discussed you cannot justify the outcomes and i think so we need to we need to start building the trust amongst each other say that hey this is my model these are my variable inputs and this is what the outcome is until as we come to that platform i think so it's 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 again whether it's 12 cycles or the 20 cycles the debate will keep on going i think it's very important that we need more collaborative approach you know all stakeholders should uh, come to a common platform to find a solution otherwise sab apne silo mein kaam karte rahenge aur wo chalta rahega i think and uh, dr shalaja mera ek sawal aap se hai uh, aap to delhi mein hai aap uh, nirman bhavan mein hai you you know delhi mein but uh, bahut sare states hai jo hamare country mein apna mm -hmm. is lung cancer ke treatment mein ya cancer treatment mein unka कुछ अपना मतलब सबके अपने अपने फाइनेंशियल मॉडल्स हैं इनोवेटिव मॉडल्स हैं तो आप कुछ एग्जांपल्स दे पाएंगे कि कौन 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 से स्टेट हमारे क्या मतलब इसमें क्या कर रहे हैं जी जी देखिए सेंटर तो अपना प्रोवाइड करता ही है बट हमारे बहुत सारे स्टेट्स भी हैं जैसे कि मध्य प्रदेश है जहाँ के डायरेक्टरेट ऑफ हेल्थ सर्विसेस कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट के लिए आपको काफ़ी कुछ ग्रांट मिलती है और आंध्र प्रदेश का है वह एक योजना ही चलाते हैं मातृ करके कैंसर के लिए और गोवा स्टेट है जहाँ पर के कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट के लिए स्पेशली रंग कैंसर के लिए वो लोग ग्रांट देते हैं और बहुत सारी महाराष्ट्र है आंध्र प्रदेश हो गया असम है तो ऐसी बहुत सारी स्टेट्स हैं जो कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट में हमें सहायता देती हैं और हम लोगों को पता ही नहीं होता है काफ़ी जो बेनिफिशरीज़ हैं उनको पता ही नहीं होता है कि स्टेट भी काफ़ी ग्रांट देती है तो वो भी यदि उनकी अवेयरनेस जनरेशन प्रॉपरली हो तो उन्हें भी ये पता चलेगा कि वो वहाँ से आ, सहायता ले सकते हैं आयुष्मान भारत तो है ही जो अभी हमारा पहले का सेशन हुआ था जिसमें आयुष्मान भारत के बारे में बताया गया था कि जिसमें फाइव लाख रुपीज़ की सहायता पर फैमिली पर ईयर मिलती है तो वो भी एक बहुत बड़ा यदि हम सब के आयुष्मान कार्ड बनवाने में हेल्प कर सकें तो वो भी एक इस दिशा में आगे एक कदम होगा या लार्जेस्ट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस स्कीम इन द वर्ल्ड आयुष्मान भारत 
और काफ़ी मतलब पाँच साल हो गए आयुष्मान भारत को 2018 में एंड देर टू फ्लैगशिप प्रोग्राम्स विच इज़ रन बाय एन एच वन इज़ आयुष्मान भारत प्राइम मिनिस्टर जन आरोग्य योजना एंड अनदर वन इज़ ए बी आयुष्मान भारत डिजिटल मिशन विच इज़ एक्चुअली विच किकिंग ऑफ वेरी वेल एंड डॉक्टर शिखा ऑफ कोर्स यू नो शी इज देयर इन एन एच एंड शी शी कैन ऑलवेज वाउच फॉर वाट आई एम से डॉक्टर शिखा आपसे ही मैडम नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज टू यू ओनली रिगार्डिंग इफ यू यू नो एनी की पॉलिसी चेंजेस और एनी रेगुलेटरी मेजर्स विच यू बिलीव इट इज नेसेसरी टू कैप द आउट ऑफ पॉकेट एक्सपेंस फॉर लंग कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट सर अकॉर्डिंग टू स्टडी ऑनकोलॉजी ट्रीटमेंट मेडिसन अगर हम देखें तो 56 परसेंट शेयर इन आउट ऑफ पॉकेट एक्सपेंडिचर 56 परसेंट ऑनकोलॉजी ओके 10 परसेंट ऑफ डायग्नोस्टिक्स ओके मेडिसिन का ही 56 परसेंट सो मेनली इट्स मेडिसिन ओनली राइट सो आई थिंक वी शुड इनकरेज टू डू स्ट्रेटजी परचेजिंग बल्क मेडिसिन जेनरिक मेडिसिन जन आई मीन जन औषधि सो आई थिंक दिस काइंड ऑफ इनिशिएटिव वी शुड टेक इट सो दैट यू नो वी कैन कवर मोर एंड मोर नाउ लाइक इन पी एम जे वाई ऑल्सो सिंस द ऑनकोलॉजी ट्रीटमेंट इज़ वेरी वेरी एक्सपेंसिव एंड वी ओनली गिव फिफ्टी यू नो फाइव लैक्स टू आर एवरी हाउस होल्ड पर ईयर सो आई थिंक इफ वी डू स्ट्रेटी परचेजिंग और बल्क परचेजिंग इट विल हेल्प अस मोर and it will help us uh, you know to include more and more packages if uh, also uh, we should ensure a essential medicine at the level of public facilities even we should encourage uh, you know investigations at the uh, public facilities so that you know we can do some uh, policy changes in upcoming future or okay but one more thing uh, what are the challenges you face in designing the health benefit packages I mean, क्या चैलेंजेस आते हैं आपको क्योंकि यू नो यूनिटी यूनिट टू सी द मार्केट ट्रेंड बाकी क्या रेट चल रहा है इसका मतलब आप जब डिज़ाइन करते हैं तो चैलेंजेस क्या क्या आते हैं सर एज बी डिस्कस लाइक बजटरी कंस्ट्रेंट्स बजटरी बजटरी कंस्ट्रेंट वो तो एक मेजर इशू है मॉलिक यू वुड लाइक टू आई एम एडिंग टू वॉट राइट आई थिंक सो द बिगेस्ट let's say uh, the reimbursement package right the cost of reimbursement package is one of the biggest challenge that we are facing right now uh, uh, as far as nha is concerned and that that leads to uh, this whole again argument of what is the actual input cost i don't think so we have got those data system which are capturing actual input cost but nha now is is lucky to have a kind of since as you said five years longitudinal data we have expenditure data and i think so we are nha is, is is in a process of looking at the data and see that what could be the actual input cost of providing uh, care for high end uh, at least uh, packages and that's that's something that that we are moving it into direction to see that uh, you know what could be the the best way of of because that is very important precursor for getting more private sector uh, providers on to network at the moment the pace at which private sector networks are on board we need to catch up on that that pace of getting more private sector on board but the biggest kind of challenge of private sector getting on board is is the reimbursement package the quantum of reimbursement package and i think so if if i'm incorrect uh, not incorrect then nh is is focusing on getting this cost and benefit uh, valuation appropriate so that we can got more private sector on on board uh, of 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 pmj and Absolutely. aligned with abdm which is kind of linking all this so there is a continuum of care pathway uh, uh, right from health and wellness center to secondary care to tertiary care so that the patient navigating across uh, system is, is easy and, and and which is one of the slide which rohit also mentioned indirect cost was was subsequent so that indirect cost estimates can go down decreasing in out expenditure absolutely and what dr shekha was mentioning that 56% of the uh, you know treatment is medicines even i personally when i was working in the rajiv gandhi cancer institute i have analyzed the you know the treatment cost the patient bill any bill if you see average 60% of the bill component is the drugs part medicine part baki room rent or baki ke sab diagnostics lab test and this 60% drugs ka component hota hai koi bhi ek patient ke bill mein aap dekh lijiye average so it's very much matching actually you said 56% so very important this part 
Yeah, sure. One of the critical reasons why also we're seeing is increased kind of uh, flare up on the drug cost is also the time of diagnosis of disease. Uh, because I think everyone talked about prevention. I think uh, it's, it's also critical to see that if you, if you look at an early breast cancer patient and uh, a late breast cancer patient, the therapy and modality would completely change. And ma'am, I think th that's where we, the difference comes in the drug cost. A metastatic patient will not have any surgery done, right? We'll only do palliation and the surgery cost will be do uh, go going down substantially. So when we look at the life cycle of the disease itself, um, one, diagnosing them early will be critical. There you'll see a completely different health stack where surgery cost will be flared up and the drug cost will go down. And I think, I think maybe I'll stop here just so that uh, yeah. why we're seeing this is because our metastatic population is substantially high. Just to kind of give a numbers to what I'm saying, uh, on an average, in a year, we see one lakh new cancer cases of only lung cancer. And out of that, 70 to 80,000 patients die every year. Only 20,000 survive. Why? Because most of them are diagnosed late. And if we diagnose them early, they'll live longer. And obviously, that leads to kind of much, much better societal benefit as well. So I'll just talk. Can you also uh, say something on research in early cancer and access to? The th therapies, I mean, innovative therapies. Yeah, sure, sir. I think uh, the couple of points from a, from a uh, research in the early cancer uh, types, and in fact, uh, my medical oncologist uh, friends here would kind of really vouch for that. Uh, one, di diagnosing lung cancer in the early uh, early parts is quite difficult, but I think we are seeing a lot of early pickup happening uh, because of the uh, one uh, kind of uh, there are a lot of awareness increase which has happened, uh, and what we're seeing is because of the early cancers, uh, we have reduced diagnostic cost because majorly in the early early tumor types, we do not need to kind of diagnose that level of genetic panels. We definitely do genetic panels, but most of the therapy is more pronounced towards surgery and then benefiting the surgery. So I think uh, our entire Merck research and MSD research uh, in early cancer, specifically lung cancer I'll talk about, uh, is um, if the metastatic uh, therapy, uh, therapy is for 35 cycles, the early early tumor type therapy is only for one year, which is like 17 cycles. So the therapy cost is lesser. Uh, the uh, the benefit is much 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 pronounced. The okay. patient lives longer to six and a half to uh, seven years time frame. That's fun. From an access standpoint, we are doing multiple aspects. I think uh, and and Nilma is here, who's our head of access. Uh, one definitely, I think uh, as um, uh, as as we're seeing about patient advocacy, uh, there are a couple of elements which we are kind of also engaging with patient advocacy. Groups groups uh, in other therapy areas um, which which are kind of uh, are kind of more uh, less uh, i would say less popular like lung cancer and breast cancer there we are kind of talking a lot with patient advocates uh, to create awareness and access from a drug standpoint we are doing couple of um, uh, pieces where uh, especially if you see uh, out of pocket patient as madam mentioned yeah. a substantial chunk of the uh, drug cost is kind of associated to the out of pocket patients okay. uh, there we are kind of creating an access models, financial models to benefit patients with lesser cycles to be purchased and higher number of cycles to be given free of cost from our side. So that kind of financial models are also there. Uh, it's difficult to kind of give access uh, kind of programs in a government setup because these can't be implemented so smoothly and uh, centralized manner. Obviously, this can this can be done, but I think it's it's evaluation metrics which we'll as a pharma and in a, a model of uh, and and government orientation can be happen. But I think this is what we're doing for out of pocket patients. From a diagnostic standpoint, we're offering completely free of cost PDL1 testing. Okay. All our tests uh, technically last year we did. 2000 tests, PET uh, no, not PET CT, it's a PDL1 test, test, which is genetic PDL1, test. It yeah. is somewhere cost around 12,500 uh, rupees for okay. patients, but we do it completely free for the patients uh, if they come to us. Yeah. So one more point. Uh, I think uh, PMJY fund. We should, uh, you know, uh, public sectors. They should ensure uh, by using, uh, you know, PMJY funds that they should uh, purchase essential medicine and diagnostics to you know, cover and give uh, more appropriate uh, treatments to the beneficiaries. I think utilization of PMJ funds in the uh, public facilities is very, very important. Yeah, because the public, the contribution of public is I think 60% and 40% uh, is by the private when we talk about the Aishman Bharat uh, scheme. Uh, that's where we need, more, uh, under, it is underutilized actually. And uh, uh, if you see it's scattered, if some states they are overutilized, some states underutilized, some states you find optimal utilization. My last question, I think we'll wind up the session after this because uh, Ritika has already 
given me this chit and <laughs> so Dr. Uh, Abhitab, ko, last question. So, uh, insurance company's role, you know, to cap out-of-pocket expense, aap kya kar sakte? So, unlike… Then we'll wind up, yeah. I don't know if it's working. So, unlike in various geographies across the world, where they have comprehensive care products, and by comprehensive I mean they cover OPD and IPD both. In India, we cover only the IPD portion of it, and the reason for that is very simple that the insurers do not have sufficient data and they don't know how to price their products. So within the industry, if we have this kind of data, so if anything can be priced, that can be insured. So that's the simple philosophy. But we don't know as to how much the outgo could be. So that's simple, you know, within the industry and within all stakeholders, if there is a price point attached to it, which is approximately the insurance companies can come out um, uh, with some kind of coverages. However, as of today, lung uh, cancer is covered within the IPD uh, on some daycare basis. Then uh, OPD is not covered, of course, the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy. Another challenge, which I will conclude uh, in India is that the moment you come out with OPD products, everyone is going to come out and utilize their OPD sum insured, be it whatever. So insurers are, as of today, afraid to, you know, put this OPD component within their insurance products. But the only solace here is that life insurance companies have certain products which cover cancer care. So they cover it for medical, um, uh, they, they give a lump sum benefit. So if somebody is covered for 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs, though they you know, give that, and the rest of the coverage can happen through the IPD route, which is the general Thank insurance. you. So more need to be done by the insurance company. I think it's a, it has been a wonderful session and a very insightful session, uh, sharing their thoughts, uh, you know. Each panelist has uh, done his job, his or her job very well. Do you want to say The last word by uh, Dr. Shailaja. So, today's message is that prevention is better than cure. तो यदि आपको कफ रहता है लंबे समय तक या वेट लॉस हो रहा हो शॉर्टनेस ऑफ ब्रेथ हो या चेस्ट पेन हो तो जरूर अपना चेकअप कराएं और लो डोज जो सीटी स्कैन होता है उससे पता चल जाएगा कि स्क्रीनिंग में आपको मदद मिलेगी रिस्क फैक्टर्स अवॉइड कीजिए स्मोकिंग टॉक्सिन्स एयर पोल्यूशंस ये सबको अवॉइड करिए और very rightly said about the uh, preventive part. Even when I was with Rajiv Gandhi, I, I did a study. You know, the uh, patients visiting OPD, 70% of the patients visiting OPD, new patients I am talking. Every day we used to have 100 plus patients in OPD, out of which about 10 to 15 new patients every day visiting OPD. But I, the result of my study was 70% of the patients, they are reporting to the hospital at late stage when, you know, in an advanced stage of cancer, 70%. So, prevention is so important. We are not aware. There's lack of awareness. You have symptoms, or some cancer is like that, which doesn't manifest, there are symptoms so much. We don't have awareness, we don't know. If I have a small breast lump, I'm ignoring it. You know, not bothered. I'm not aware that we have self-breast examination, we have to see it. Uh, you know, for any cancer I'm talking, I'm just giving you an example of breast cancer, which is very common among female. One out of every eight female, you know. So this is, uh, I mean, alarming situation. So I think we, we need to create more awareness, the role of advocacy group, and uh, all stakeholders, government, uh, the private, uh, the insurance companies, all should come together in one platform and, uh, you know, try to find out this uh, innovation, innovation, innovative uh, solution, financial solution I'm talking of. So this is the last message from my side. And thank you, Asuchem, once again, to, uh, you know, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. Thank you so much. And thank you, audience. Thank you for being a lovely audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank sir. You. We'll not be taking any questions for this session as we are running out of time. I. So I would request all of you to please join us uh, for a group photo. For a group picture.
Thank you so much to all the dignitaries for joining us and everybody present in the room. Thank you so much for being here. I would request everyone to please join us for the lunch now. The lunch is served outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much to all of you. I was your host for the day. My name is Harsha Pane. Please have a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Please join us for the lunch.